$1,000 Visa gift card. Visit O'Reilly.
Good morning. Good morning. I'm Steve Barish. I'm from Sandia National Laboratories. I'm also part of AIAA's Aerodynamic Measurement Technology Committee, which has organized this morning's event on the impact of particle image velocimetry on aerospace technology. So I have the privilege of introducing our opening speaker, Ron Adrian, and then moderating the panel session to follow. Uh, but first, uh, a couple of items of logistics. So we will begin with a, a one-hour lecture from Ron Adrian, and we'll follow that with any, any questions that are specifically on his lecture. And then at that point, we will uh, we'll start our, we'll invite our other panelists up here and begin the panel. So if you haven't been part of the Forum 360 so far this week and you're not aware of how we're asking questions here in the, the modern age, well, it's all on your, your phone, your tablet, your laptop. If you uh, surf over to, let me see if I have this right, aiaa1.cnf.io, I got it right. Um, you can ask a question there, and um, perhaps more interestingly, you can see all the other questions that audience members have asked, and you can vote up the ones that most interest you, and I'll be able to moderate or monitor that from the panel and um, ask the ones that have the broadest interest in the audience, although I suppose I retain an executive veto. So um, with that, on to our main event. Uh, when, we, uh, when we began to plan this event uh, about six months ago, really we only had one name at the top of our list for who we wanted to headline this event. And of course, that was Ron Adrian of Arizona State University. And that's not simply because Ron is the inventor of PIV, but it's because he has been integrally involved in seemingly every major advance in the technology in the more than 30 years since. And in fact, his insights continue to drive where the technology needs to go in the future. And his pioneering measurements haven't just given us this new instrumentation capability, but they've also been key to influential new understanding of wall-bounded turbulence and other fundamental fluid dynamics. So we couldn't be more fortunate than to have Ron here with us this morning or have a better way to set the stage for our panel discussion. So please join me in welcoming Professor Ron Adrian. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thanks to AIAA for sponsoring this event. Um, now, I'm I'm told that that um, a lot of CFD people were encouraged uh, to come to this meeting, since the topic of the um, panel discussion afterwards is the impact on on fluid mechanics and, and aerospace. And uh, so I, I'm going to spend uh, some time just uh, making a sort of introduction to, to PIV, uh, hopefully not more than 10, 12 minutes, uh, and then get into things that, uh, that would uh, be of more interest to people who are already experts. So if I can have the uh, next slide, please. Is this mic okay? Sounds a little loud to me, but okay. So uh, just in, in outline, I want to induce, introduce PIV. Uh, I want to look at the advancements uh, from the beginning up to the present state of the art. Uh, then look at what's, what's happening now. Uh, uh, talk about some of the contributions uh, to aerodynamics. These are being very well explained just by the, the talks in this, in this uh, um, uh, the series of sessions before and after this, and then talk a little bit about wh what I think some future directions might be useful. Next slide. Yeah, let me try that. That works. Okay, so uh, if, if you're not an experimentalist, uh, this, is, this is what PIV does for you. It gives you a field of, of vectors. Um, mainly on a plane and mainly two-dimensional vectors, but we'll see that that can be, that, that's where we started at least. Uh, and of course, uh, you can see just from this picture, you, you can't, can't actually see an individual vector, but uh, you can certainly see that this gives you a good flow visualization, uh, much better flow visualization than you would get, uh, oop, that went backwards. Um, Where's that? 
There. Much better than you get uh, uh, looking at smoke visualization, for example. Um, now, uh, I, I was interested in PIV uh, from the very beginning because in the mid-70s, uh, I became very much interested in the st uh, structure of wall turbulence. Uh, and and e even going back to when I was a, a student, uh, I, I never really understood what made wall, uh, what made turbulence tick in flow over walls. Uh, where, where did the motions come from? Um, I, I did my PhD thesis actually in thermal convection because that's a turbulent flow where it's obvious that the, the buoyancy causes the fluid motion. But you can't say the same thing for wall turbulence. And, and so th this was a matter of uh, you know, sort of driving curiosity to me. And you look at pictures like this and you get some uh, tantalizing information, but you can't really figure out where those big bulges are coming from or why those, uh, they're, they're those sort of inclined uh, regions. So uh, that's why I was interested in PAV. Um, why, why should we be interested now? Well, this is a plot from uh, Jerry Westerwheel that um, uh, shows that a lot of people have become interested in PIV. The blue line is, is the growth of uh, references to PIV and, and uh, the green one is hot wire and the black one is laser Doppler. And you can see that, that, uh, that PIV is, is becoming um, uh, m more widely used than its, its predecessors. So uh, before I go any further, I want to acknowledge all of the people who I've worked with and, and have made important contributions. Um, and I'm going to start with Chengsheng Yao because uh, Chengsheng was my PhD student. He worked in thermal convection. And, and then um, we got a grant from National Science Foundation that allowed us to uh, start developing PIV. And um, Chengsheng worked on that as a postdoctoral student for several years. And, and so um, he, he was uh, uh, key to uh, the early developments. And uh, the next person who came along was Chris Landreth. Uh, Chris um, was a half an engineer, half an artist, and, and um, I, I guess the PIV appealed to him because he could see these velocity fields. Um, but I have to say, he, he later went on to become a film director and, and producer, and uh, he's even, he v even won an Oscar. So um, uh, he didn't stick with PIV. That's, uh, um, oh, I'm sorry. I, 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 want, I wanted to acknowledge uh, also uh, Jerry Westerwheel, who, who uh, I've worked with uh, for many years, and, and, um, and we wrote a book together and, on PIV. So, uh, and then uh, Dr. Zi Chao Lu over on the in the third column was another co-worker at uh, University of Illinois, who was uh, very important. So, um, very simply, uh, if, we, if we think about defining velocity of fluid, uh, we're going to pick some fluid element and, and measure its displacement in time delta t and let delta t go to zero, and, and uh, that's velocity. We all know that definition. Uh, trouble is, you usually can't see fluid particles. <clears throat> in fact, there isn't such a thing as a fluid particle. Um, so, this is just conceptual. Um, and um, what we have to do is actually mark the fluid with particles and then measure the motion of the particles. This, um, um, let's see how this works. I'm trying to use the pointer. Do I point at this screen or? Yeah, okay, I'll use this, good. Okay, so this uh, little um, uh, diagram up front uh, is a picture I took many years ago uh, of some uh, pond scum behind uh, Trinity College in Cambridge. And it occurred to me then that certainly someone as bright as Newton would have looked at that 
and said, uh, hey, I can see the fluid motion using those uh, uh, algae clumps as, as markers. And in fact, you can see the Lagrangian pattern of the motion here. Uh, in fact, it wouldn't surprise me if some uh, nerdy caveman didn't do the same thing. It's such an obvious thing to do. So um, I uh, uh, think that the, the natural th trend was then to uh, uh, use small particles rather than things that deformed like groups of algae and, uh, and to track their motion. So here's a concept of just a, a, a particle at, at time one and a particle at time two and we measure the displacement and knowing the time uh, we get the velocity. You uh, people who are into numerics will note that we, we um, actually assign the, dis the velocity that we measure to, to a position that corresponds to the midpoint between the two particles and that amounts to uh, just second order accurate uh, central difference. So this is an example that was, that was also done very early um, uh, of particle tracking by Yutami and Ueno. And um, you can see uh, that they got a pretty good picture. I'll blow that up uh, on the next slide. Oops. There we go. Uh, now observe that the vectors are um, randomly located and they're fairly sparse. Okay, and they're certainly not on a uniform grid. And when you get down in the region of the wall where the magnitude of the flow is changing, uh, the velocity is getting smaller, uh, the results are very poor. Okay, so in other words, they could tune things up to be good out in the, in the disturbed uh, outer flow region, but um, it was difficult to um, have enough resolution to cover the whole range of velocities. Um, okay, so uh, we, we actually have to think about the fact that experimentally we're measuring the displacements of particles uh, uh, and those are Lagrangian displacements and, uh, but we usually want to assign that to an Eulerian measurement at a certain point. And uh, so, as I said, we'll, we use the midpoint and then if you actually write down an equation for particle dynamics uh, and divide by delta t, you find that the, uh, the difference is uh, over delta t is, of course, the answer that we usually get. But then these are correction terms. This term actually corrects for spatial gradients. This one corrects for particle inertia and lag. And then, of course, these terms now are uh, higher order and we normally don't think about them. Okay, so, uh, but you always have to bear in mind that it is particles we're looking at, not fluid. And in certain flows, you have to uh, take that into account, i.e. highly accelerating flows or great high, flows with high gradients. So um, the, the problems of uh, random location and um, sparsity of the vectors uh, can be, is solved by increasing the concentration of particles and instead of tracking individuals you track groups of particles. So this, uh, this picture um, here is, is a double exposed picture. Uh, you can see pairs of particles if you look at it the flow is I think just horizontal left to right and you see pairs of images and um, so and you see that they're quite dense now. Um, this is just another blow-up view, uh, give you a better idea. Um, and uh, let's see. Okay, so I, I've isolated a small region uh, and and blown it up here, and now this is taken at time t, and then I'm going to. I show you another one at time t plus delta t, and I'm going to try to flip back and forth so you can see the motion. Let's see if that works. Okay. So what I recommend is that you, you look at this um, triplet 
of particles. They're very bright. You can see them over here. And then you know, just, just watch them. You can see they're moving down and to the right. Okay? So that's the idea of PIV. You're going to look at groups of particles, not individuals. And, um, and the question is, of course, uh, how, do we, how do we get a nice uniform field out of that? Well, uh, what we do is, is to uh, divide the field of view up into small squares and uh, we analyze the motion from T to T plus delta T in each square. And the way we do that is by uh, performing a cross correlation between the first image at time T and the second image at T plus delta T. So we arbitrarily we shift the first, uh, the second image with respect to the first by an amount s, and, and uh, that's a 2D vector in the plane, and we shift it until we get a maximum in this correlation, which means essentially that the second images are lining up with the first images. The shift at that point then uh, tells us what the, uh, what the displacement of the particles were as a group. So um, here, um, this is just a one-dimensional example. So imagine these are the images of three particles at time t1, and here's the image at time t2. The flow has displaced the, the images to the right. And uh, now let's uh, multiply those two together. And on the bottom, you'll see the product. A nice big one right there, OK? Now, you have to imagine integrating under this bottom uh, curve at each, t at each shift value. And when you find the maximum value of that integral, that, that's the displacement that you're interested in. OK? Um, so in two dimensions, it looks like this. Here we, we have a SX and an X, SY, and, and there's a nice strong peak corresponding to the fluid displacement of the particles. And then there's a bunch of noise peaks, which correspond to random uh, overlaps between uh, different particle images, but not the whole group at the same time. Uh, so if you do that, um, uh, you'll get a vector field like this. Each one of these vectors is now coming from one of these little interrogation spots. And uh, typically, uh, with, with the typical uh, digital cameras that we use these days, there'll be 32 by 32 or 16 by 16 pixels in each spot, and typically um, 32 or 64, um, let's say, uh, measurements across the field of view. Um, just a, a, a historical hindsight, we started out, we didn't have digital cameras, um, we had to use film, uh, but film has much higher resolution than digital cameras do even, even today. Um, this is an example uh, where we took an image in a backward flow over a backward facing step uh, on, on um, four inch by five inch uh, uh, tech pan film, which has a resolution of 300 lines per millimeter. And so this actually gave us 385,000 vectors. <laughs> Okay, um, so you know, uh, the film is, is awkward and as soon as digital cameras became available, everybody loved them and, uh, and they made uh, PIV much more uh, usable. And I, I won't ever try to talk anybody into using film again because I know it's hopeless. Uh, but if you did have a big facility and you want to make primo measurements, I think you should use film even now. So, for example, some of these special turbulence facilities in Europe that are going up that are, you know, big, I, I, I think it would be a mistake not to use film. Anyway, here's a typical PIV system. Pulse laser giving you two pulses, very short pulses, 10 nanoseconds. Laser light sheet, um, camera, and then you digitize and, and uh, go through a bunch of steps. Uh, uh, the main thing is this displacement correlation to get the displacement of the images, and then from that you get the velocity by doing some further processing. Um, now, uh, I, I want to move on from the basics to discuss 
uh, how the capabilities have advanced. And, and I mean, this is the holy grail. We want accurate, fully resolved velocity in space and time on any scale we choose and hopefully able to resolve a wide range of scales. So the two-point spatial correlation, I think, was really the, the main uh, development that made PIV uh, work. Uh, in Gertigan, I think, uh, Copenhagen and colleagues came up with the idea of a, of a dual cavity laser instead of uh, uh, two separate lasers or, or uh, one laser double pulsed within the fluorescence time. Uh, image shifting, I won't go into details here, but that was actually an important development for about a decade. Um, it, it, the, the dynamic range up to that time was only about 10 to 1, and it increased it tenfold. And so we went from having like a one-digit voltmeter to having a two-digit voltmeter. <laughs> okay, well, that, that made a lot of difference. Uh, then um, subpixel accuracy was an um, important step, and then using uh, um, uh, s second windows that you actually translated instead of staying within the, f the first interrogation spot. So with these steps right here, it was possible to perform some, some uh, serious f fluid mechanics. And um, this is an experiment that um, we did in the late 80s and published in 91. Uh, this flow in a channel, uh, parallel channel, bottom wall, top wall, vector field, colored lines here are the vorticity field. One of the things PIV does for you is you can get vorticity for the first time. With all these other techniques, you could not measure vorticity um, uh, satisfactorily. Okay? Incidentally, all this nice artwork, that, that was Chris Landreth. You can see his artistic uh, inclinations. Now, um, the other thing that we did um, around that time, what are the dates on this, 90 and 90, 91, I guess. We, we did measurements in IC engines. Uh, first first uh, time was a cold uh, fire, uh, 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 engine, and the other one was a fired engine. But these are the first times we'd been able to see flow fields in a, in a good way in, in, uh, in inside uh, automobile engines. And of course, this was a collaboration with people at uh, GM and, and uh, Princeton and, and Illinois. So um, along around 1995, uh, Luis Lorenzo um, had the idea, why don't we make a camera that can store two images in very close succession, like a few microseconds or longer. And then we could ha have two independent uh, image frames, and then we could do cross correlation instead of auto correlation. And uh, so we we all have Luis to thank for. I, I, I think it was Kodak that he encouraged to uh, develop this camera, and they are the industry standard for PIV today. Now, not every not every manufacturer is interested in PIV by a long shot. They're much more interested in much huger markets, but. There are some who, who uh, still cater to our needs. Okay, now the, di the, the difference, oops, I'm sorry, I'm looking at my computer, not yours. The difference um, in uh, resolution was huge. Today, 29 megapixels is pretty big. Uh, if you compare that to film, uh, it, uh, the four inch by five inch film is over a thousand megapixels. So. Uh, we gave that up, but we gained all sorts of convenience, and we gained the possibility of, of taking large numbers of vector fields and uh, averaging and getting good statistics. Um, next thing that came along was stereographic PIV, so you, um, uh, visualize uh, or, or record two images with a stereo camera on the plane. And then uh, after that, there was some work on holographic uh, PIV, and um, of course, to do holograms, you, it's ordinarily thought you, you have to use film to, because you need very high resolution to record the interference patterns. Um, and it was a terrific pain. <laughs> um, believe me, I, I had one of the, Don Barnhart, one of the best uh, holographers I know, um, 
uh, and, and it was a lot of work to get a vector field like this. So um, then um, uh, adaptive windowing al algorithms that um, would not only displace the interrogation, the second interrogation window, but they realized that uh, suppose you're looking at the center of a vortex where the mean displacement is zero, everything's just going around in a circle. Uh, so what you have to do to measure that is actually rotate the second window, not just displace it. Okay? And then, of course, if there's straining going on, you should do that too. And this, this gives you uh, better results because you get much stronger correlation peaks. Fulvio, this came out of TU Berlin, didn't it? Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I apologize for not getting the reference down. Another development was micro PIV. Um, when you look at it these days, it, it seems simple. You just use a microscope, but there's actually quite a few um, uh, technolo technical changes that have to be made to make it work. And um, uh, Carl Meinhardt, Juan Santiago uh, were, were the uh, originators. And um, the, I found it interesting because it's very seldom in technology that you see an existing technology improved by a factor of 100. We're usually much more incremental. Okay, so here's a, uh, this is a 180 micron diameter uh, capillary right here. And you can see the double exposed images. Now, when you, when you, you don't use a light sheet. You just flood the area with light, and then you get a lot of scattering off the walls, and th that can be blinding. So one of the essential uh, aspects is that you use fluorescent particles that fluoresce at a different wavelength than the light from the walls, and uh, then you, you can see the particles. I didn't get a chance to dig up a figure for this. Joe Katz and colleagues, uh, um, were pursued uh, uh, holographic PIV, and then, of course, they realized that digital cameras wouldn't have near the resolution unless they looked at a very small region. And so they, they actually had uh, quite a bit of success with digital micro-holographic PIVs. Um, extreme environments, uh, this is a picture of a rocket exhaust, and... Um, one of the big questions is, since you can't see the 3,000 degree rocket exhaust, um, how are you going to get particles? Well, you, you, uh, basically you pray, okay? And, and uh, sure enough, when we looked, there were particles there. We don't know why, and we don't know how to control them, but there they are. So um, these are, um, the, sorry. Um, okay, so here's the rocket exhaust. Um, that's, that's just thrust versus time. And then um, here's the PIV field. Um, some interesting details where the rocket's actually throwing other burning particles off like little sub-rockets. And then these are velocity profiles uh, at different locations uh, in the rocket plume. You can see they're quite similar. Okay, um, we got interested in doing some uh, experiments with explosions to really exercise the power of PIV. So this is an exploding bridge wire, a five micron gold wire, and you put several joules through it in a few nanoseconds, and it blows up. And uh, there you see a nice picture here. Um, so we, we wanted to look at uh, the initial shock that's produced. The bridge wires and other related devices uh, are used to be the initiators of an explosion. And, uh, and of course, since they're so small, they're very precise, both in time and space. So um, we first did measurements in air, and uh, they were very nice, but uh, we noticed that there was significant particle lag uh, across the shock front. Uh, in fact, it took about three millimeters for the particles to catch up to the velocity behind the shock. So then we um, decided, well, explosives are solid anyway, so uh, we used uh, PDMS plastic blocks seeded with particles. You can see a region here where we put a lot of particles in. 
And, and then we would uh, plaster this uh, bridge wire up against the bottom of the shock, or I'm sorry, the bottom of the, of the um, PDMS block. And um, then when it ignited, it, it sent a shock wave uh, into the PDMS, and these are Schlieren's at different times. Uh, to catch that, we needed, we needed um, um, very fast camera, and this, this camera will do 300 million frames per second, but only four frames. Okay, actually eight frames if you use it just as a camera, but four PIV frames. So it actually has four PIV cameras, and they're all looking uh, through the, all these beam splitters at the same field, very carefully registered. And uh, so we can, we can expose these cameras at any time we like with a three nanosecond electro-optic gate and, um, for each camera. And actually, the reason that was so important is that the flash from the, from the initiator was so bright, it would blind any other camera. So you had to have a very short exposure time uh, right on the order of the laser pulse time. And then to illuminate each frame, we had uh, one laser for each frame. So eight lasers, another bunch of prisms, uh, combining it all into one light sheet, which again was very accurately registered. Um, so this is a Schlieren, so you can see what's going on. And I like to say, look, if you've got a dime that has a zero on the date, uh, we were taking measurements of several hundred vectors inside a half of one of those zeros. Okay. And uh, so this is a picture of the particle image field. And then these are the movies we could take and the PIV fields we could, we could get. Okay, so now let's talk about contemporary PIV, what's going on now. That's interesting. Well, I'm sure uh, many of you have seen tomographic PIV and, of course, the high-speed cameras that are allowing us to make movies. And then I was very impressed yesterday um, with the presentations on measurements inside full-scale wind tunnel facilities, um, sometimes with fields of view up to a meter or so. Um, there, there's, a, there's a lot of interest in um, determining, not necessarily increasing, but determining the precision and accuracy of PIV measurements for the purpose of verification and validation. Uh, so uh, if, you, if you're trying to validate a, a PID, PI, uh, I'm sorry, a CFD code, and, and you ask for an experiment, and the experimentalist comes in, and you've got, I don't know, 15% difference, you want to know, well, what's your error bar, Mr. Experimentalist, and, and is it your problem or mine? So um, that, that's a good development. I like that. You should always put error bars on your measurements. And lastly, there's some interest in, in um, acceleration fields. Sorry. So let me say a little bit about each one of those. Uh, here's tomographic PIV, and the idea is uh, you, you illuminate a volume now, uh, not, a, not a thin light sheet, but think of it more like a fairly thick light sheet. You look at it with at least uh, three or four cameras, sometimes more, and uh, you, you get Im images um, from each camera, two images, T and T plus delta T, and then you um, use these, the, the pixel information in these images to um, uh, reconstruct um, the intensity, the equivalent intensity distribution in the fluid volume. So you're not actually tracking particles, all you're doing is you divide this fluid volume up into um, uh, many cubes called voxels, uh, generalization of a pixel, a volume pixel, and uh, then within each voxel you find uh, uh, a coincidence between these, these images uh, by, by multiplying them together uh, and you get a, a sort of pseudo intensity, which you then cross-correlate using three-dimensional cross-correlation 
to get a vector field. So this work um, uh, came out of uh, Delft um, with, um, oh shoot, cut off some, some authors here. Uh, Fulvio Scarano and 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 Yer El Singo was the, were the first authors, and then Weinecke and then Udhausen were next. So um, anyway, this is a very important foundational paper for uh, holographic, or I'm sorry, tomographic PIV. There was earlier work um, done um, using uh, just the the idea that the reason this works with only four cameras instead of let's say 256 views like your doctor uses in a CAT scan, is because the image is so sparse. So there was some early work done on that, but it never touched on the idea of PIV. And then there were PTV uh, papers also, uh, uh, a lot of work by uh, Dracos and Moss in uh, ETH in um, Switzerland. So, um, oops, oops, oops. Another, another picture, nice, nice uh, uh, drawing uh, showing the, the different steps and, um, and uh, the sorts of fields that you um, hope to get and can get out of it. So this is a flow in a channel and you can see, you see all sorts of eddies. Look like hairpins and I'll talk more about that later. Okay, so uh, this is an example I put in uh, by Elsinga, um, and, and it's a supersonic boundary layer. And uh, just to show you that you can do this in high speed as well, and these, uh, the purple is low speed region and the green is uh, vortex cores. Um, now, high-speed digital PIV, uh, one thing with these cameras, if you want to go to really high speeds, the way they do it is to reduce the number of pixels in the view so that you just have about the same information flow in terms of bytes per second as you would with more pixels but uh, slower rate. The megapixel cameras, uh, typically uh, 10, 20,000 frames per second, and they can do this for hundreds of frames. But this spacing between one frame and the next uh, here, which would be a, a, a 20th of a millisecond, um, is, is, is good enough uh, for low speed flows, but not so good for, or n not usable for high speeds. So these cameras aren't fast enough to, to really replace um, um, uh, the idea of using a double pulse uh, and recording uh, two images. So, uh, for example, I, I, I calculate if you don't let the particles displace more than a quarter of a millimeter, that five meters per second is about the, the maximum velocity where you could use the camera framing as a, as a delta T. Um, now, the large field of view uh, measurements, I mentioned the best discussion of those was yesterday. Um, the digital cameras simply aren't going to see individual particles when the field of view is large, okay? If you imagine taking a square meter of, of particles and mapping that down onto a square centimeter of CCD sensor, you aren't going to see individual particles whose diameters are about 30 microns. So um, what you're actually seeing in these experiments are speckle patterns or at least um, uh, clumps of particle images. And um, of course, uh, uh, th so that, that's, that's just sort of a note of caution when you think about doing this and, uh, because it, it may affect some parameters of the system. Then as the field of view increases, the distance to the camera increases, meaning you collect less light for the same size camera lens. To, and, and then the laser light sheet goes, intensity goes down. And so this becomes very difficult. Um, now, uh, I'll make one point here. As you make, uh, you might say, well, let me get more scattered intensity by using bigger particles. And that's a good idea, uh, provided they follow the flow. 
But once the particles get into the regime of geometric scattering, which happens at around uh, between 50 and 100 microns, so the scattered light intensity is proportional to the area of the particle, but the I image of the particle is proportional to the area of the particle. So the intensity, which is energy per unit area, is a constant. So in other words, you could, you could put ping pong balls in your wind tunnel and they wouldn't be any brighter than a 100 micron particle. Okay. Um, so precision, oops, oops. I'm afraid operating two devices at once is beyond me. Um, there's much more emphasis on, on uh, determining both precision and accuracy. Precision can be done just by repeating the experiment. Uh, precision basically means uh, how reproducible is the experiment. Accuracy is much harder uh, it, it, because it may depend on, on, uh, on things that aren't random but actually defects in the measurement scheme. Um, so in CFD, what you do to validate your code is to change parameters. You increase the, the number of mesh points to s make sure that your simulation is, uh, computation is independent of mesh size, et cetera. Well, we should be doing the same thing with PIV. We should be, instead of just optimizing our PIV systems, hopefully there's a range that's within the capability of our instruments where we can we can uh, vary the uh, delta T and the interrogation spot size and maybe some of the many parameters that go into these algorithms and see that we get the same answer. And I said that hopefully, okay? I, I think we're not there uh, yet where we have much of a range to do that, but we, can, we should start trying. Um, and I will also emphasize, as you listen to people talk about accuracy, uh, the accuracy of a mean value will be much higher than the accuracy of a single vector field. When you average all these errors together, quite often they, they uh, are reduced. So um, let's talk about accuracy. Um, why, why are PIV measurements uh, noisy? It's because we have to, in effect, locate the centers of, of two particles, which are these gray regions, and there's some indeterminacy in locating the center, which is the red circle. Uh, and um, so when you go to measure the displacement, um, your accuracy is essentially the sum of the indeterminacy for this particle, this particle, divided by the total displacement. So there's a very simple model for that. Um, uh, you simply say that the dis error in the displacement is some constant times the diameter of the particle. So the finer the particle, obviously, the easier it is to locate its center. All right? Or the particle, we're always talking about images here, the particle images. Um, this is something that, that I proposed, um, I don't even remember when, but way back. Um, and it was just seat of the pants, okay? I had no justification other, other than in, intuition for for uh, using that, but it, it guided a lot of thinking about directions PIV should develop. And um, it wasn't until, um, I think about uh, 2010, that Jerry Westwheel actually managed to do a, a, a um, uh, correct analysis, and he came up with exactly the same formula, provided the displacements were bigger than about a, a half a particle diameter. So, any and the, his value for C tau was about what I had found em, empirically. So uh, anyway, this is the problem. We've got this random error. Uh, typically, the error um, magnitude is uh, you know, uh, determined by the C tau, which is in this range, and uh, you you let the maximum image displacement be about ten image diameters, and so the uncertainty in displacement uh, is about uh, 0.01 times the maximum displacement over the actual displacement. 
And so if the actual displacement is close to the maximum, then you have a 1% measurement. But if the actual displacement is only, say, 10% of the maximum, then you have a 10% error, okay? And I don't even want to talk about what happens when it's only 1% uh, of the displacement. So um, maximum displacement. So the point is that, that uh, PIV, um, you can get good accurate measurements if you tune your system up so that most of the vectors you're seeing are giving you displacements near the maximum. Uh, but then if you have a, a big dynamic range in the velocity, and say the velocity goes uh, down to very small values, you're going to make some bad errors in those small values. Um, so if you plug in this estimate for error, you get uh, this C tau D tau over the maximum displacement times max over actual. And um, so what you try to do is adjust your delta t's, it's the easiest thing to adjust on a PIV system, to keep the displacements as large as possible. Okay, so typically you can say your error, your accuracy is something like 1% of full scale, maybe a half percent, um, but in that range. I've seen a lot of papers quote a thousandth of a, or 0.1%, or, or but I've never actually believed it. So what influences C tau? Um, there, there's a list of them here. I won't uh, enumerate them. I'll simply let you uh, look at them. Um, and uh, the, the algorithm is the, what's received the most work because uh, people can change algorithms easily. They can't change pixel resolution or SNR or fill factors. It's up to the camera manufacturers. Now, uh, the other thing is uh, uh, the size of the image uh, in one dimension, let's just call that L sub X. Um, so the more um, uh, pixels we have, the better. And I already mentioned film's a lot better at that than cameras, so I won't belabor the point. Well, this leads us to define two things, the dynamic velocity range, which is full scale velocity over your velocity resolution and if you divide through by delta t, it comes out like this. And then the dynamic spatial range, which is the field of view, Lx, divided by the spatial resolution, which again is the maximum displacement you're allowing, okay? Now the interesting thing, obviously, if you want a, a big uh, DSR, uh, you either want a big camera or small displacements. If you want a big DVR, you want a big camera, or uh, C tau to be small, okay? And of course, uh, the image diameter should be focused as small as you can. The interesting thing is you multiply these two together and you get it something that looks like Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. The product of the uncertainty in space and velocity is a constant de defined by the uh, field of view and number of pixels and then C tau and then the image diameter. So if, if you want to win, you've got to change this combination of variables, okay? So um, again, uh, Jerry did this in, in, a, uh, uh, in a chapter we wrote for annual reviews. So this is the product, DSR times DVR. So it's a measure of PIV quality uh, versus Reynolds number. And this is in turbulent flows where you really want to have both a large DVR and a large DSR. And so you can see it more or less follows uh, a straight line here. And uh, all of these are digital camera. And then this is the, uh, a film, okay? Uh, and of course the film is winning because it's got a big LX. Okay. Did that go backwards? Okay. So uh, future directions. If you if you look at the uh, equation that we would write for the measured velocity, it's going to be delta x over the particle over delta t. But then there are other effects. Uh, for example, if there's a gradient in velocity between where the particle is along this trajectory and where we assign the measurement to be, 
um, the bigger the gradient the, and the bigger the separation, uh, the more error we have. And then also particles have inertia, and so they lag with some time constant T sub P, and so acceleration causes this error. And um, so the question is, um, how do you know where the particle actually is um, along the trajectory when you only measure these two endpoints? And how do you measure this acceleration? Well, the idea is to add a third light pulse uh, shown here. So this, is, this light pulse is at T2, and this one is at T3. This is the initial one. So now we can, we can estimate uh, where the particle is located uh, instead of saying, well, it's just someplace between these two images. And we can also estimate the uh, acceleration and do some correction for this term. Um, there's also an expectation that um, it will improve the accuracy uh, just uh, of just the d delta x over delta t measurement. So this table compares, suppose you have a circular streamline, uh, theta dot is the velocity, r theta dot, r theta double dot is the acceleration. So, and the displacement would be r theta dot delta t over non-dimensionalized by r. So you look at this table and um, you can see that there's a, there's a range of displacements from 0.1 to 1. Ordinarily, we keep the displacement small because we, we want our straight line approximation to be accurate. But now the question is, if we want to increase the displacement, increase delta x p max, uh, say by a factor of 10, so we get 10 times better uh, quality, uh, quality um, how, what happens to our spatial resolution? Uh, then the other thing is if there's acceleration, the acceleration here I'm taking from zero up to uh, 0.25. And then also there's noise in the images and so we put in various values there. So let's compare 2D and 3D uh, position error first. Uh, if we use a short displacement, um, with 2D, it's 0.13%. Uh, With 3D, it's 0.004. So you can see it, it's a lot better. In fact, that's generally true all the way through. In fact, sometimes there's an uh, order of magnitude or more improvement using the third pulse. Okay? Uh, velocity accuracy, um, this, would, this would be kind of the typical PIV, no acceleration, uh, two pulses with the small displacement. And um, actually, you see in that case, the, uh, um, with, a, with a noisy image, the two pulse actually is slightly better than three pulse. But then, with, with, that, with a few exceptions uh, where they're about equal, in general, the three pulse is, is uh, more accurate and sometimes considerably more accurate. Okay? So, um, looks like you can buy something by adding an extra pulse. Of course, you're going to pay for it because you're going to have to add an extra laser or something, and um, you're going to have to figure out how to record three separate images. How am I doing? I'm done. I didn't see your cane waving. <laughs> well, so, so this is, um, I am almost done too. Uh, this is an idea that was um, oops, proposed uh, some time ago by um, Greenholz uh, to use a, a third order correlation. So the product of intensities at three different times. And here's a relatively sparse uh, interrogation spot. Uh, and uh, here it is with three exposures. Here's what double pulse PIV gives you. Here's what triple pulse PIV gives you. The, the signal-to-noise ratio defined as the height of the signal correlation over the height of the, no of the tallest noise correlation is much, much improved. Okay? Trouble is, you've got a four-dimensional space to search here. You've got a very two-dimensional R and two-dimensional S, uh, which is a, a backbreaker. Uh, but there's a way to cut that down to just a three-dimensional uh, search. And um, that actually has other advantages. Okay, so impact of, of PIV on aviation, well, 
again, I'll leave it to the authors presenting their individual research papers to, uh, to explain how it worked in all these different cases. And um, understanding the turbulent boundary layer, this is one of our, our first measurements of um, turbulent boundary layer flow. And the thing we noticed almost immediately just looking at the vector fields was that there were these kind of dark regions and then lighter region and then a dark region. The darkness is because the vectors are long and they overlap. So you, it's just more ink being put down in this region when you plot all the vectors. Here, the vectors are moving backwards. It's a low speed region close to the wall. Here, the, the, um, we've subtracted a velocity such that the true velocity minus the subtracted velocity is essentially zero. And then up here, these vectors are positive. So high speed outer flow, medium speed, low speed, all right? And uh, then we also noticed that when we looked at vorticity, the vorticity seemed to, uh, these regions are, are contours of vorticity, seem to line up along the backs of uh, these, these uh, triangular ramps. And then we also noticed that under each vortex, there was a sort of characteristic vector pattern where the flow was going backwards faster than average and it seemed to happen along a line about 45 degrees. So this led to the development of this hairpin vortex model, uh, uh, packets of hairpins, not just a single hairpin, but actually uh, packets of them aligned. And um, each of these hairpins induces flow to go backwards, just like a, one coil in a uh, uh, magnetic coil. And then, as you know, if you add multiple coils, uh, in a magnet, you, you intensify the flow, or you intensify the magnetic field. Well, this intensifies the low speed flow. Um, this is a wind tunnel in a laboratory. Um, is this picture valid um, at higher Reynolds numbers? This is uh, Reynolds number uh, RE theta 10 to the ninth in the atmosphere above uh, uh, Great Salt Lake. And you see these same ramps, and then if you look along here, it's just smoke visualization, but you can see evidence for the hairpin heads, okay? So this is well within uh, the boundary layer. The region of our, our, our wind tunnel measurements was this region right here. But even if you increase the scale by a factor of 10, you still see this, and if we'd had enough smoke and enough lasers, I, we think we would be able to go up another factor of 10, and we would have still seen it in the log, going up to the top of the log layer. So future developments, well, it's obvious uh, we can combine all these things, uh, multiple pulses, TOMO, high-speed recording, better signal processing, There's a lot of work to be done yet. And uh, in the end, we may reach our, our um, holy grail of accurate, three-dimensional, time-resolved CIV measurements. So with that, I thank you very much. We have some interesting questions on the web app that I think will be excellent for the panel. But if anybody has questions specific for Ron's talk, uh, we can still use the old-fashioned technology <laughs> of lungs and larynx. Yeah, and I'll repeat oh, it. Okay. Yeah, Ron, of course, thank you for the interesting presentation. Um, I'm puzzled by your statement about uh, when we move into the geometric imaging of particles, not gaining in uh, particle, say, intensity. Mm -hmm. Because, of course, to go to large scale, it is interesting to go for larger tracers. Now, I would say say, when we speak about particle peak intensity, you are certainly right, because the peak intensity is the ratio between the, the intensity and the area. But if you look at the overall energy, the integral that comes from a tracer, and if this energy is all within the diffraction spot, or say a pixel, in that case, the, the geometric, these, these objects that are flying in the, in the air, provided they, of course, uh, behave as good tracers, will be more visible. That's our experience with uh, this um, sub-millimeter uh, bubbles filled up with helium, and indeed they, they, we receive much more light. We can see uh, these particles much better. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, it, well, it, you know, of course, a, a, a helium-filled bubble is different from a, I mean, you, I'd actually have to look at the scattering calculations to say what what range you, uh, you would find, what size range you'd, you'd find transition from one behavior to another for that case. Um, I agree the helium-filled bubbles are uh, an attractive approach, but, uh, but in general, uh, there will be some size at which you're going to be looking at actual pictures of the, oh. of the bubble, not yeah. just, just um, uh, uh, some scattering of light. And when you get to that, then what I'm saying is it won't do you any good to go bigger. Yeah, no, I agree with that, yeah. thank you. Anyone else? I have a question about the uncertainty principle that you introduced for PIB. Mm -hmm. so I understand that uh, uh, it works perfectly for film PIB, because when you indeed you decrease the particle image diameter, it is easier to detect the centroid position. But I have some doubts about uh, uh, digital PIB, because of course there are peak locking errors that are introduced when the particle image diameter is smaller than the pixel size. Can you comment on whether you can still apply the, that principle? To yeah, the um, I, I should just say that you know, this is the fundamental <laughs> uh, errors. And if you introduce other imperfections like finite resolution of the, of the camera um, and um, uh, some fluid mechanical effects on certainties in the velocity, for example, then you have to add those in. So um, that would it, it'd be somewhat akin to taking Heisenberg's uncertainty principle for uh, you know a small particle and then talking about a, a bunch of particles. <laughs> it doesn't apply anymore. And and uh, so you, uh, your intuition or your feeling is is quite correct. There are situations where you just wouldn't want to use that. But at the same time, if you optimize that right hand side. Uh, it's still going to make the best of what you, your system has, okay? Unless some other source of error just, if you only have one pixel, you're <laughs> it doesn't make any difference what else you do, right? You're not going to get make a measurement. Do we have any other questions? All right, then I'd like to uh, invite the remaining three quarters of our panel to join us on stage <laughs> in our comfortable seating. Almost like the Inquisition. <laughs> so let me make uh, introductions for uh, our, our new arrivals. Uh, starting on the end, we have Susan Gorton. She's from NASA Langley, where she uh, is the project manager for the Revolutionary Vertical Lift Technology Project. I think I have the buzzword correct. But uh, she, she is here because there's probably no program, at least in the US, that has made greater use of PIV for developing flight vehicles in large scale wind tunnels. So she can speak towards that impact. We have Fulvio Scarano, a uh, professor from TU Delft in the Netherlands. And um, he has authored an extraordinary number of papers in the past 15 to 20 years and has been on the forefront of much PIV development in, in that time. And we have Miguel Visval, who um, is from Air Force Research Laboratory at Wright Pat. And um, he is the team lead for computational aerodynamics, which makes him seem like the odd man out on this panel. But it's important to have him here because CFD has been built on a foundation of experimental data, and PIV is a very important uh, part of that experimental data. And he can speak towards how computational models are also reliant on P PIV as, as part of that experimental database. Um, so Susan, would you like to begin with uh, any opening comments? Sure, I'll, I'll uh, say a few remarks. As, as Stephen said, I'm the project manager for the Revolutionary Vertical Lift Technology Project. And prior to this position, I also was a researcher with the Army Air Flight Dynamics Directorate and looking at using optical measurements, particularly around helicopters and road 
rotor blades and things where you can't put mechanical systems in place to make measurements. The wake, very, very important as Luther Jenkins was talking about yesterday in his paper. Uh, in order to understand how rotorcraft function and how they're going to operate. And in order to get those kind of measurements, we needed to go to optical techniques. We used a lot of laser velocimetry in the 1980s and into the 1990s, and then the PIV systems came into play, and for the large facilities particularly. So we're a proud supporter of a lot of the work that's done in particle image velocimetry, and I think it's important to make sure as project managers you're aware of the amount of effort that it takes and the investment it takes to go into that. And, and I'll also say, I, I uh, assume Ron knows, but uh, Chung Sheng Yao is here in the audience and we're very lucky that he works on our project as well. So we've, uh, I think, had a lot of advancements in that area. Olio, any opening thoughts? Yeah, sure. <coughs> of course, uh, first of all, it's my pleasure to be here today with uh, this uh, distinguished uh, colleagues. and. Um, no, well, I sit a little bit on the other side uh, of, the, of the channel because uh, I started working on PIV uh, at the time of my PhD. So my professor sent me to the Von Karman Institute, a remote place in Belgium, and said, okay, go there, learn about PIV, and then come back. I did the job, so I learned about PIV, <laughs> then I did not go back. I stayed at Von Karman Institute uh, for, for the large part of my time. And then I kind of fell in love with this technique and with all the potentials that, uh, that, uh, that the PIV has. So um, actually at TU Delft we built uh, quite a group uh, that is very enthusiastic about uh, uh, PIV application for aerodynamics but also on the method itself and uh, say our mission is to uh, really exploit all the potential that is given by this fantastic hardware, cameras, lasers of course and, um, and what, are the, what are the unexplored directions about algorithms that can be used to improve the fundamental limits mm -hmm. that uh, Ron has already, has already spoken about. So from that uh, philosophy came out, uh, for instance, the, the, um, the improvement of uh, window deformation with multi-grid approach or the tomographic PIV, and now we are moving towards uh, uh, time-resolved tomographic PIV, and I hope that in a few years we will see PIV deployed more massively for industrial testing, possibly also a large-scale PIV. I would like to uh, anticipate a word to my colleague that comes later. We also see at least the vision would be that uh, PIV in a not so long time will blend and will shake hand stronger and stronger with CFD, not only, uh, say, a posteriori, after an experiment and after a simulation, but even during the experiment, it would be possible to use uh, CFD techniques to, to, improve the, to improve the data. Having said that. And Miguel, I believe you had a few slides yeah, you wanted I have, to show. Yeah, I put a few charts yeah. there. I guess I, I don't know if I should stand there. Um, yeah, it should be. Is it available at the podium? So, ah, here we are. As we discussed, I'm the, the CFD are here, so <coughs> I, I just wanted to mention uh, interactions with PIV. So, uh, as Fulvio mentioned, yeah, I fully agree. Uh, PIV and CFD both are uh, great techniques that uh, have helped us and will continue to help us to probe uh, a variety of flows, both in terms of industrial validation and prediction, as well as flow understanding to try to enhance system performance, if you understand it well, if you know what the critical elements are. But uh, that's, that's philosophically <laughs> a very good thing. However, in practice, it doesn't always happen, and in part because we tend to be segregated in terms of CFD and, P and experimentalism. So we need to pay attention to a great deal of, uh, of details al uh, along the process and a key component is early coordination of experiments and simulations. Traditionally, we look at experiments that have been done in the past and try to simulate. Well, in reality, they should go hand in hand because there's issues of wind tunnel interference, the capabilities of the computation in terms of how big a mesh, mesh one can address. In addition, we want to intersect. Even if there is a broad parameter space, there might be the opportunity, although more costly, to look at a specific set of conditions that allow us for a more fruitful interaction that sometimes uh, a posteriori doesn't happen. Uh, also, we have uh, to be mindful of the, the disparate uh, uh, resolutions and, and uncertainties that Professor Adrian mentioned. And, and they are different, and some of them are similar because we're talking about Olerian and, and, and resolution spatial techniques and so on. 
uh, in many problems, one aspect in CFD that we don't have is the realistic environment in either a wind tunnel or in the in the in the real in reality where free stream turbulence can have significant effects of transition location, and there are many other disturbances in rotor craft. It's even, as an example that is very difficult, but you have vortex meandering, all kinds of structural disturbances, and what do they do, and how do we incorporate that in our comparison? And of course, there are issues of elasticity where deforming and moving meshes are also a challenge for us as well as near the surface for measurements. So uh, we need to interpret the results appropriately and each one has its strength. And uh, one of the issues is that, and it was mentioned earlier, instantaneous is hard to get in PIV, but instantaneous is what we get in CFD. And to actually get phase average and time average results sometimes are, are very hard to do uh, in, in simulations. Let's say you have to do many cycles of emotion it's easier just to do a couple of cycles and get instantaneous picture. And again, in the talk uh, this afternoon, I will describe the fact that sometimes our resolution is quite disparate. In some cases, very fine for this DNS and LES, and we cannot directly compare with experiments. Uh, so we have to do methods of reducing the data to the same level of resolution to really do quantitative measurements, and then adduce what the proper flow elements are. So. I don't want to take too much time, but I think, again, that the, hopefully this uh, opened the discussion to have uh, honest interactions of seeing what the limitations of, of each approach are. And although for controversy, I'd like to add that neither a single well-executed uh, PIV nor a well-executed CFD is necessarily the right answer. So sometimes when they disagree, we have to then go back and look, and that's where the importance of concurrent and preliminary coordination of the experiments and simulations is quite critical. So I think I'll leave it with that. Thank Thanks, you. Miguel. Um, so at this point, I'd like to encourage the audience again, um, please use the web app to ask any questions you would like to pose for the panel or look at the questions that have already been asked and, and vote up those that most interest you. And uh, we'll bring them in front of uh, our experts here. Uh, but where I'd like to start the conversation is by discussing the ways in which PIV is and is not a mature diagnostic for aerospace use. Sometimes I feel like I, I get a perception that um, parts of our community regard PIV as a gee whiz diagnostic that's still used by academics in some basement laboratory on campus somewhere. But that neglects all the things that it's doing now in large-scale wind tunnel testing. It's been used in gas turbine engines. It's used in scramjet research and industrial flows. So clearly it has a lot of capabilities past that. Um, so what are the ways in which PIV is, has become mature for production testing, and in which ways does it still have some distance to travel? Susan, you're probably in a good position to lead on that. So, so, uh, so I, I guess I would use the word production testing a little carefully. Uh, I, the way in which we're using uh, PIV is for research, um, where when you say production testing, you may be talking about, oh, say a wind tunnel test that uses thousands of runs to come up with a particular configuration, or, uh, whereas our direction usually for a PIV type application is to look at a specific problem and uh, understand that problem in depth, and even when we're we've we've done recent tests uh, that help with things like configurations of uh, systems that may be fielded soon, like Kiowa Warrior, looking at. But you pick out particular aspects of that problem rather than try to do PIV on every single run in that uh, in that test campaign. And, and I will say that that the use of the CFD ahead of time in a true prediction method helps you define what areas are of interest, what areas may, you may have questions about the CFD, you want to get data that then helps inform your confidence level in the CFD and, and define more what that flow field looks like. And, and that's the way I think we look at running this, the PIV in large facilities. So we have to carve out that particular time, but I, I don't think it's turnkey yet. And that's when you say production. I think people say this is, it's, it's almost like taking a force balance measurement. It's production, it's standard, it, it's done on every test. And I, I don't think we're there yet. Well, yeah, I, think yeah, I would also agree with that. I, I think you are giving, of course, a, a good example of how to make PIV experiments in, even in industrial wind tunnel. I think when Steve was referring to production testing, we, we know what we have in mind. It's essentially a, a bunch of uh, engineers that want to set up the system and then they have a matrix to, 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 make, uh, to check 
and then they have to run the tests. And uh, when now we should, we might ask ourselves, okay, do we want to go against this type of testing, or do we see in the future that this type of testing will uh, will disappear? Uh, to be honest, I don't think it will disappear because there is uh, some emphasis on this production testing, and where PIV is not ready there. I've seen uh, even yesterday in the presentation uh, lots of impressive uh, analysis, but still, the, for large-scale PIV, there is a patchwork of uh, fields of view that is very laborious. So we need certainly something for larger scale. And um, also, I think it was recognized by many uh, uh, speakers that the time spent for the setup, the time spent to solve solutions about how to place the seating, solve solution about uh, uh, optical access, the time spent is actually maybe 80% of the time before you come to the so-called production. So uh, I, I th in that sense, PIV is not yet Turkey, and we, yeah, indeed, we need some some technical solutions there to to speed up the production testing. But but your your point of view is also, I think, very interesting because uh, the idea is also to try to steer the community a bit away from this uh, brute force testing and think a little bit ahead and have s interaction with CFD so that we can tailor the investigation so that the experiment is is a, is a true experience, not just not just acquisition. I, I, I definitely agree with that. I think, um, in fact, some of the investment that we make is, uh, within our, our project is to speed up exactly the acquisition and the setup so that the, the cost to acquire the data it starts to drop and that it can be used in conjunction with a, a multi a multiple different kinds of measurements. So, you know, your first test where you're trying to do a large field of UPIV might take you a long time to set that up. The facility might have to be modified. The second test is going to go a lot, a lot faster, and the question is, do you have the tenacity to fund those, you know, multiple tests so that you can actually do that uh, optimization of the system and, and get yourself positioned to do the, the measurements fairly regularly? So, you know, within, within the NASA system, we are targeting for rotorcraft. We have specific f facilities that we commonly use. You know, the large facility is 14 by 22. Transite Dynamics Tunnel, the National Aeronautics Full Scale Complex in Ames. So we target our our investments in those facilities to try to improve the capability to do that. So we're not looking to do it everywhere, but we are looking to, to target those particular facilities. Are there things that the facilities operators need to do differently to better accommodate PIV, or is PIV moving into a position where once you get through the setup and you're operational, you can keep up with the run schedule that the facilities require? <laughs> <laughs> well, I have to say I wasn't there for all the okay. shifts. <laughs> so okay. I'm looking to see how, if Luther is thumbs up or thumbs down. Um, the, the operators, whenever you put a, a per, particularly a high-powered laser system in the facility, you have to have all the safety features activated, you know, all the interlocks and all that, and that, that does slow their normal pace of a production operation down. But um, in general, I know that the team has been investing in ways to remotely um, translate, you know, even over a large distances so that they can calibrate once and then translate the entire optic system so that, that remotely that they can keep on pace with a lot of the, the, the tunnel data acquisition. Uh, as I said, a lot of our research specifically is carved out so that we want that particular type of information. And so it's important to get as much of it as we can get, but it's also important to do it the right way so we understand uh, what those measurements are. And I, I would also add that uh, one component uh, of the, say, the efficiency and productivity still comes from the experience of the operators. We even have seen in the PIV challenges in the past years, uh, uh, it, the result depends on the algorithms, but also depends on, on the people. You have some very uh, top experts that know how to interpret an image and know how to find the way for the best way to analyze the images. And uh, so I think an important factor will remain how do we train our engineers how do we make them skilled uh, in uh, optics, in, of course, uh, safety uh, using lasers and, uh, and cameras and PIV and that acquisition? Because that really makes uh, uh, all, the, all, the, all the chain of operation much faster. So, and I think the, 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 the chimera of the turnkey system where a robot is setting up cameras and lasers so is a, 
is, is not very close in time. And, and in fairness, other wind tunnel measurements do have the same difficulties. Using a wind tunnel balance is not as straightforward as you may think and requires skill of the operator as well. And it can be prone to failures or delays just like a PIB system. Yeah, but the PIB system is less compact. You know, the chain is, uh, the, the parts are all everywhere. Is, is a less co of a compact system. The chain is very long, so you can do mistakes at uh, several points. So um, let's, let's shift the conversation. We've, we've alluded to this a couple of times. Let's talk a little more in detail on uh, what impact PIV has had on CFD and the ways in which programs are benefiting by using PIV and CFD in, uh, in a synergistic fashion, to borrow a buzzword. Miguel, you had to know I was going to look at you for this one oh, first. Yeah. Well, I mean, I guess it tends to keep us honest for one thing. <laughs> We have something that we have to compare with that is not just a data point, but rather a whole field, flow field measurement, which is similar to what we do. So we're looking at entire flow fields. Uh, I would say in general, so far, the mindset still persists that, that the experiments are the, the truth and, or the manifestation of the truth that we choose to, to go with and that the simulations must uh, accommodate or, or conform to that. And I have had many benefic beneficial interactions in, in, ser in several projects where really we encounter issues with both, actually, the simulation and the, C and the PIV or other types of measurements, that it, wasn't, that it was only by the fact that we worked concurrently in the problem that we were able to identify. It, as examples are, for in, as I mentioned in the chart that I had, was the effect of free stream turbulence. And when looking at Reynolds number, uh, transitional flows on, on an airfoil low pressure turbine, they're extremely susceptible to free stream turbulence. And if you look at publications of separation location, for instance, you find that they are a scatter, a tremendous amount of scatter uh, associated with that. A another example in looking at dynamic stall was the fact that uh, the impact of the sidewall interactions could dominate the latest stages of dynamic stall, for instance, that we couldn't account for. So, so it takes a, a back and forth to try to eliminate all of this uncertainties. But of course, uh, w when it comes to getting a picture of the, of, the, of the basic flow structures, and if you're looking at a phase average problem, PIV gives you that. Uh, and you're able to cover a broad range of conditions once you have a setup working properly, and it's very hard for us to, to do a very large set of computations. But I've been thinking that we should all also go backwards in the sense that we are now able, given the advances in computer hardware and high order solvers and so on, we could do boundary layers with billions of grid points, for instance, or other configurations. And that data could be used to then ascertain this error in PIV in great detail, and Ron mentioned some of the different defects of delta T, the particle lag, and so on. We could actually then go backwards and use that to address, or, 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 or give us an estimate based on a, on a flow that we know, canonical flow that is well resolved, be able to determine what kind of agreement should we expect anyway, given a certain measurement. Uh, would that, I mean, this is, this is happening. And yeah. this is probably so, yeah. This is already happening. Yeah. Uh, DNS, especially DNS, because it yeah. has uh, the least modeling uh, uncertainties. Yeah. And DNS is used in uh, in a number of cases. Uh, there are very famous uh, simulation in channel flows or turbulent boundary yeah. layer that have been then used to replicate yeah. to mimic uh, a virtual PIV experiment. So the people would put particle in the yeah. in this uh, correct, in this yeah. flow, and that would uh, also simulate uh, the imaging of the cameras, possibly even a little bit of the noise. And then uh, it was very, very, uh, I think, instrumental to understand some of the mm -hmm. fundamental uh, limits and issues. Uh, I refer to tomographic PIV, for instance, where you have these uh, issues with the reconstruction of large number of particles. So this is already happening. Yeah, and uh, I think that, that it could be pushed to even less canonical flows, such as you know, wind sections and things of that nature, where we're effectively doing a very detailed simulation and then, let's say, dynamic stall vortex formation in rotor craft and other parts where, due to the complex flow structure, it's hard to, or delta wings, for instance, where it's hard to, to maintain particles in certain aspects of the vortex flow and so on. So, if, if Steve allows me, I would like to turn the question in a, in a least comfortable direction for you, yeah. <laughs> which is, <laughs> now we are speaking about how uh, uh, 
computer simulation can be used and are instrumental to uh, verify the validity of PIV mm -hmm. and uh, to verify also what are the basic uncertainties. What's your impression on when PIV has been used and has have an impact okay. on, on, on your decisions on which direction to take in order to improve the, the solution methodologies for, for the modeling? Well, uh, if there was any. W when it turns to actual numerical simulation, which is equivalent to your particle tracing techniques, are it's really a, an independent process based only on applied mathematics that we look at our algorithms. Where, where the technique uh, has been considered by some is when looking at the structure of the boundary layer or other aspects of the flow, then you could try to come up with improved uh, structure-based type turbulence models that would tend to replicate what is seen in PIV. But to be quite frank, I haven't seen that mature into in a way that is that has been used to, to a great degree. We're still using the same turbulence models that, that, are, that were established earlier, and they are not necessarily based on a great deal of the precise details achieved in, in PIV. I don't know if Ron would, would disagree with that, but so, so I'm not saying, no. that, I'm not blaming the PIV community, I'm blaming perhaps more the CFD community because it's very hard to, to take that knowledge and that is very complex and translate it into a simple model that would somehow give you the reality of, of a complex turbulence flow just by using a, the time average or the Reynolds average approach. So, but that's an open, it's a question for discussion because there is continuously the desire to use more and more uh, that information to, to inform what kind of turbulence model one does. And the same is true of LES and DNS. The LES and DNS, which is essentially like a PIV, where you provide all the details, it's very hard to take all of that complex information and reduce it to a point that, that you could then make a very simple term in a turbulence model. But there are some examples, uh, stretch vortex modeling and, and other types of modeling that take into account the structure of, of the boundary layer or of, of the wall. So, well, Ron, um, you've been involved in the analysis of simulations of wall boundary turbulence. To, to what extent have those been reliant on the physics that you've already provided from PIV? To what extent have they brought something complementary to this problem? Um, the, um, the direct numerical simulations are, um, I find them useful because uh, they have to be converged and therefore they have a finer resolution than we have to have in PIV. We, we can have a coarser uh, resolution in PIV because if the, the flow is still satisfying the governing equations. <laughs> and, and so um, uh, all we have to recognize is that we, if we have a, a resolution cell, uh, say a millimeter cube, that we're averaging over that, okay? Whatever the true flow field is. Uh, when you do DNS, you might have to have a tenth of that resolution just to make sure your algorithms converge. And, uh, and uh, so that's one thing. The other thing is um, until the advent of Tomo PIV, um, we really were dealing with two-dimensional slices. And um, you could infer things from that, but then uh, with the DNS, you can see the full three-dimensional field. Okay. So um, if you know what you're looking for uh, in a DNS, the trouble with DNS is it's got so much information, uh, you, you really need to know, a, you need to have a good question. Yeah. You, can't, you can't just go wandering through the woods. <laughs> the, the problem Miguel was just referring to. Yeah, and uh, I'll, I'll tell an anecdote back in 87, um, uh, Carvies Moyne and John Kim organized the first uh, summer school on uh, uh, numerical turbulence in, in Stanford. And um, they had this data set on channel flow, which was unique at the time. And um, they invited a bunch of experimentalists. And, and we all showed up thinking, you know, just give me two weeks with that data set and I'll tell you how turbulence works. And, uh, and uh, we all came away empty-handed, you know. We, we all came away having done something, but it wasn't, it, it was really hard to wander through a bunch of vectors and, th and, and, and even with three, good three-dimensional 
visualization and, and understand uh, what was happening. So, and even using things like standard, standard thinking like contours of vorticity and so on, it, it didn't, it, they weren't up to the task. So it, it took 10, 15 years to develop tools and to understand how to interpret the tools in order to understand the, the, the DNS and the visualization of it. And we find today that actually when we, for, we're not looking for time averages, we're looking for details in the structure, but we find today that, that um, we spend more computational cycles on visualization than we do on doing the uh, simulation. <coughs> and, and it's actually on that, that visualization side of things that um, we could use some significant improvement. Now, let me pull that thread a little bit more. Can we take some of the scientific visualization methods that have been developed for CFD and apply them to PIV in a way that um, either allow us to get more out of the large PIV data sets we have, or perhaps more importantly, to get something out of them more quickly when we're doing a wind tunnel test or something that requires a faster turnaround? Are we finding techniques now, uh, perhaps that originated from the CFD community, that allow us to get some insight into that data in a more reasonable time period? I, I know we are. Um, we have a very close coupling of our, our CFD and experimental group. In fact, I, I usually refrain from referring to them as two separate groups, right? We have a research program and we have people with various skills and some of those skills are CFD and some of those skills are experimental. Uh, and so they're together a lot. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have found that some of the visualization, particularly in the high resolution, high fidelity, CFD methods uh, is applicable, but of course you have to make sure your data is in the right format. And so those discussions on what's the right format and what are the parameters that we're looking for, uh, but you know, we start using the Q criterion for a lot of the visualizations. We're looking at how can you do automated vortex tracking uh, that is valuable for both the CFD and the PIV. Uh, there's an effort, I know that I was in a discussion here on Monday night with the, there's a discussion group on doing hover calculations for rotorcraft, and, and they've had sessions at SciTech, and uh, what they're looking at for the upcoming SciTech is to take these calculations and put them into a common system and be able to slice that data at different planes and be able to compare, cut, you know, cut planes of data and computations at the same positions. But you do have to be careful you're comparing apples and apples because it's, it's easy to get, um, you know, make sure the right reference point you know, are we referencing to the right place in space? Because that's very important, at least for rotorcraft, of, of where that wake is and how it's tracking through time. And, and that can certainly put an offset. So you have to be very careful on your sign conventions. Uh, <laughs> just make sure we're all going downstream in the right direction and, um, and, and what, that, what that maintains. But we've had very good success with that. I have a comment about um, phase averaging and conditional averaging. And um, uh, I mean, I've, I've uh, relied on conditional averaging extensively um, in trying to understand turbulence structure, but um, what I've found is that uh, if there are systems that allow a couple different possible states, um, then when you do a, a, a conditional average, uh, you just get an average of those two states and it, it, it's not particularly representative of either one. So uh, a good example of that is uh, when you have a, a flow in a duct and, and it goes through a sudden expansion, uh, if it's a rectangular duct, it can either attach to the bottom wall or the top wall. But the average, if you average over a bunch of experiments, half of them bottom, half of them top, is a central jet that looks nothing like any one of those two states. Um, with turbulence, uh, the conditional average uh, of a hairpin is a nice symmetric hairpin. But you go into the flow and look at it, and they're all like pirates. They've got one long leg and one short leg. So, <laughs> and, and they may be left or right, but, but uh, uh, if you average it all, them all together, you see a, a nice two-legged hairpin. So uh, it seems to me that RANS in particular is susceptible to this sort of problem because of the averaging. And, and um, 
And I don't say it happens every time, but I'm running into more and more flows where I see it. Does that mean our data extraction, if we take the same data extraction technique and apply it to a simulation and to a PIV data set, might we get different things that fall out of it because the origin yeah, of the Yeah, very, very much so. For, uh, I'll give you another example that's um, interesting. In thermal convection, um, suppose you have a box like these tables and, and the bottom's heated and the top is cooled. Um, if you look at uh, the convection, uh, it, you, you would say that based on the governing equations, there's no pre preferred direction, so therefore um, the turbulence should be uh, the same uh, and, and shouldn't have, move in any particular direction. In fact, uh, you get a large cell, and it'll go up this wall and down that wall, and, and you say, well, why does it do that? Well, then if you go do another experiment or computation, you might see it going the other way, okay? So e even within experiments or within computations or between the two, depending on your initial conditions, you may see one thing or the other. And, and um, in, in computations, people uh, doing simulations of thermal convection can only integrate for so long. We found in our experiments we had to average for 400 hours to see the system cycle enough between these different states to get a good representative average. And then we'd get zero mean horizontal velocity <laughs> after 400 hours. I, mean, I guess it all depends on what you value. But, uh. Have there been I, other experiences? I could, I could bring uh, the other side of the picture. Of course, uh, Ron is uh, very positive towards the experiment. I'm also positive towards experiments, but for instance, one of the frustrations we have from PIV, from, from doing an experiment different from the case of the simulation, is that we can do, uh, 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 we can evaluate derivatives uh, a limited number of times. We can't differentiate the data, actually more than once. Uh, so we can get, we are very happy with vorticity, we are very happy with the Q criterion that already involves some multiplication. If you try to do another differentiation, you start seeing more and more uh, uh, say, uh, uh, um, in fact, noise. The noise is uh, is uh, is emphasized because it is it is uh, like an, a high pass filter. Once all the time you do a derivative. So, <coughs> it, what you were saying is that uh, uh, the exercise of doing data visualization of inspecting the data and visualizing the data for an experimentalist is also very insightful because you understand where the limit is. So where there is information, if you look at, uh, for instance, the, the free stream velocity or the, the main velocity, you start looking at the other velocity component, they, they look a little bit more, say, uh, wiggled, and then you start looking at vorticity, and then if you do another derivative or a time derivative, boom, the, the game is over. And, uh, and so you realize uh, also uh, qualitatively what is the accuracy, what is the reliability of your um, information, at, at which scale is still reliable. So that's, that's to make a counterpart to the, to the advantage of the experiment. How about from your perspective, Miguel? Well, yeah, you mentioned long time averages. That's a challenge in CFD because our trend is to go to massive simulations which are very expensive and therefore you cannot run them for a long time. So that's one aspect. Uh, and in some cases, even certain averages are not possible. Let's say if I do a problem of pitching a wing, starting from zero degree up to some angle to look at the Amex stall, I can do it a thousand times. Uh, I will always get the same answer, mm -hmm. but it's hard to correlate that with an experiment in which you do it 20 times, and every time there is something slightly different that tends to have a small scale structures. So what we have found, uh, going back to the previous question of flow visualization, is that, yeah, now I see PIV is using exactly the same tools yeah. that we do, that we use, uh, have used for a long time, but we have to be careful now. In some of the cases, for instance, uh, we have looking at the unsteady flow structure. I'll show some example this afternoon. And, it, and we actually have to make sure that our, our simulation is filtered to the resolution of the PIV. So essentially, we have to take the grid from the PIV, right. average the grid points that are inside that cell, even including perhaps an overlap, as is done in PIV. And then after we do that average, then we find good quantitative agreement. 
Otherwise, if we try to compare an isosurface of vorticity in the experiments that is uh, of uh, 10, uh, for us could be 100 to, to look the same. And it's all associated with the fact that we have much finer meshes and associated with the, the issue of getting derivatives on such coarse resolution in the PID. So we just have to work with this uh, to make sure that it's apples and apples and not disparate representations. So we're, so we're converging to the same answers. But I'd also like to say there's a, a I think we're using this, the CFD and, and the, to help us in a, a different way that's a little bit larger on a larger scale, which uh, in particular with a, a rotor wake, each blade is shedding a wake and, and they shed all along the blades. So you have a sheet and then you have a strong tip vortex and that system is uh, very complex. And if you're looking at things on a 2D plane, you have the artifacts of all the wake revolutions that are within the visualization of that plane. And it's, if you just look at data from that, it's very difficult to know where those vortex you can see a vortex formation and vortex structure, and, but where did it come from? And the, the CFD really helps us look at, you know, what's the most likely place that that uh, structure generated, and you know, where do we trace it to in time of when it was generated, and wh when did the blade, you know, where was the blade when it generated that vortex, and how did it travel? So, so it's more of a macro scale analysis using the CFD. It doesn't have to be exactly right. It has to be close enough that we can identify what those structures are and where they came from. And it, it can also tell us things doing it ahead of time. Where do we place, where's the best place to put our field of view? And, and what resolution do we need in different parts of our field of view? Because we've set it up to where we have you know, a large, a large um, view and then and concentrated with other camera systems on smaller spaces within the field. Trying to, again, get our, our efficiency uh, in place to make the measurement that we want to make. But it really has helped us also define things like do we need to model in CFD? Do we need to model the strut? Well, there's a wake coming off that strut and it's coming through the PID system. And, and until we saw that, it's like, oh, our model didn't really include that. So we have had the iteration of a pre prediction, the test, go back and, and uh, improve our prediction. And, and I think, like I said, in we have two things that are uncertain, the CFD prediction and the measurements, but together we can make some forward progress, and that's, that's our goal with that. One of our more popular audience questions goes to the same theme, and it asks, with the, uh, with the addition of now time-resolved PIV and tomographic PIV, we're reaching a level of unwieldy quantities of data. So how, does, how do we pull useful information out of that in a way that we can compare to CFD? or going to your example, Susan, does it make it more easy for us to interpret what we actually see in the flow field by giving us those additional dimensions? I think we do get to a point where you're overwhelmed by data, right? I think when we were shipping terabyte drives back and forth between California and Virginia, because that was the easiest way to transmit the data, we probably had uh, as much data as we could stand. So then, uh, then the question is, what is it telling you, right? Have, have you, have you gotten so much data that you're not really able to process it in a meaningful way. So we have to guard against that and keep working on those, those areas that say these things are the important things and how do we pull that out of the data. And I think our CFD folks are struggling with some of the same, same things. And, and you know, the, what they're doing, of course, rather than waiting until the end of the solution is getting different visualization steps and, and dropping some of that um, visualization data during the solution. Not rather than running the whole thing waiting to the end. So we're, we're seeing some ways that they are doing some of the uh, system solution visualization. I don't know that, well, we can take that same approach with PIV because you have to have the answer. But there certainly is a place where you've kind of got diminishing returns of your ability to look at and analyze the data uh, versus getting ready for the next test, right? Because you don't want a room full of data and we're always testing and never looking at the data that we acquired. That's, that's something we actually have to guard against as well. Making sure we allow time to do the analysis of data after we acquire it. I, I would like to add before we move uh, to the side effects of having this uh, say wealth of data, uh, I go back to your question, say what can you get more once that you have say three-dimensional information and uh, possibly even four-dimensional information with a, with a temporal component. If we, if we stay in the area, for instance, of vortex dynamics from 
from rotocrats, then uh, certainly one might say that uh, the three-dimensional information will now allow us to see uh, unambiguously what is the vorticity content of a vortex, provided that's resolved. But uh, before, with the planar data, and Ron explained that very clearly, with planar data, you never know what is the angle between the vortex and your plane. And, uh, and sometimes if it becomes a banana shaped or, right. or any type of shape, you, you don't know if it's the vortex that is uh, uh, hitting the plane twice. So now with the three dimensional data, uh, we have made a step forward uh, towards a less ambiguous uh, identification of uh, vortex structures. And uh, while well, the four dimensional data, I would agree with you, they are very dangerous because these cameras mm -hmm. go incredibly fast and you fill up the camera with several gigabytes in no time, uh, then you, you plug it into the tomographic system that will turn gigabytes into terabytes, and then you need a truck to transport your, your disks <laughs> from one place to another. So this is really not, not funny. But uh, to spend the word in favor of it, um, at least in Delft, we, uh, we have had a lot of enjoyment trying to use now this uh, uh, four-dimensional data, and out of it, if you use now the governing equation, you can, uh, out of velocity and vorticity, you can determine the local pressure distribution. Perhaps for vortex dynamics, it might not be so relevant, but for, uh, say, a turbulence wall interaction, this is a, this is a very, uh, say, a hot topic about the air acoustics and the emissions and, uh, and, um, and indeed, vibroacoustics uh, problem and flutter. So I think that these, these new technologies are now opening the possibility for PIV to also investigate areas like air acoustics that before were not really accessible through the pressure information that comes from 3D uh, time resolved. Do we, have a, do we have any emerging consensus in the community then what are the good quantities that we need to pull out of PIV data to facilitate a comparison between data and CFD or theory? Uh, or is, is every program unique and requires us to look at the data in a different way? I'll work. Go ahead. Yeah, I'll go ahead. Uh, my understanding is that uh, at the moment, uh, a good way to, to get rid of the question, well, uh, they don't match perfectly uh, which one is uh, better or which one is right and which one is wrong, is also to try to compare them in an area where the differences and the discrepancies related to a resolution are uh, less important. So if you start uh, representing the data after a modal decomposition, and then you look at uh, the main modes, the modes that contain the largest amount of energy, in that case, you are really uh, making yourself free from a number of these uh, intricate uh, possibilities for, uh, for, uh, for um, say, um, uh, disagreement. Yeah? And of course, uh, using uh, uh, mode one, two, three, or four, or up to the first 10 modes, means that you are not asking yourself whether the CFD simulation or the PIV experiment are, the, are predicting the same turbulent dissipation. We are not looking at those scales. We are really looking at the macro scales, at the scale that produce, uh, for instance, uh, pressure fluctuations, or at the scales of, of, of large vortices and at large separated regions. So I think this is a good direction to go to make, a, to make a fair comparison and still remain very interesting because these are dynamical phenomena, so it's non-trivial non aspects of the flow that would be compared. I guess I would add to that, that that I think there's a significant difference between doing an experiment for a CFD code validation, right, where you are deliberately setting out to do an experiment to validate particular things in your CFD code. And so you've, you've worked with the, the algorithm developers and said, where, where is it that you need data? to improve your algorithms. And then you have to go in and make very specific and very accurate measurements. And that's a certain kind of test. And it's very difficult, right? Because when you ask them, what do you want? They say everything, right? And you say, I can't measure everything. I can only measure half of those things. And they say, well, I don't, can't use that, right? I have to have everything. And so, so there's this iteration. But a validation test is usually very, very, um, I guess, uh, deliberate. There's the other kind of testing that I think we do and when we talk about moving to production where we're trying to answer a particular aerodynamic or dynamic question. And, and so the comparison of the CFD and the PIV or whatever other measurements doesn't necessarily have to be exactly accurate. Right? It doesn't really matter if they're off a little bit. What matters is what did you learn about the configuration you're trying to find an answer. You're trying to find an answer of 
you know, what flow structure is set up, for example, if there's something on the nose of an aircraft that's hitting the tail, right, causing a shake. What, what thing upstream is generating that flow structure and that's, that's translating downstream, hitting the tail, and causing the shake? That, that doesn't mean, that kind of question to answer that doesn't need exact accuracy and exact comparison between CFD and PIV, but it does need a general understanding of what each of those methods gives you, right? So, so in a, a setup like that where you, you're trying to determine, say, something in a, a fielded vehicle that's got a problem, you set up an experiment that says, hey, I think it might be these things. What do I need to model? At, at what resolution do I need to model them? Do I need to model all the cracks in the doors? Do I need to model just the general features of the, of the aircraft? And then what do I need to measure? But downstream, I need to be able to track maybe certain things down the flow, but the comparison of exactly the CFD accuracy and the measurement accuracy is not as important in that case as it is a case where your, your objective is to try to make validation measurements to improve CFD algorithms. So I think we have two different kinds of testing. That's a little long-winded, sorry. I would add a third one, actually, because I, you gave a first example about code validation. Uh, in my experience, I actually, I've never experienced a case where a code developer, really a code developer, would ask for experimental data for code validation. In most cases, this uh, request for data for code validation is not really from a developer, it's from a user of a, of a CFD package, and they want to know what can they actually simulate. They want to make sure that the package they have is uh, uh, reliable, is usable, and uh, can be extrapolated to a certain number, number of configurations. And they need a couple of good points where they say, well, this has also, this corresponds quite well with the, with the, the, the PIV experiments. And, and from that point on, they continue the design process and uh, the inspection of their system with, with the code. That, that, then they are happy with that. Uh, I do not have experience of really uh, uh, somebody who really is into the, the, the code development uh, for asking for experimental data. I think so, so, the, so we have had that same a, experiment. We, we call uh, that calibration. Oh, right? I'm see, calibrating my code so I understand what it does. And the validation is from, from some of the developers. From the developers. That, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, so many times we're not looking at a point-wise point -wise comparison necessarily, but we're looking at what are the key elements of the unsteady flow structure and the unsteady loading that that would produce on a surface. So it doesn't have to be precise in terms of at this particular millimeter size, but do we get the same basic vertical structure? What is the frequency of shedding? What is the elastic instability that that's generating? So that kind of comparison is also very valuable, even if you cannot do all the minute details. But there is another level of comparison in which because of the inherent experimental setup and computations, we have difficulties in imagining certain things that could be very crucial to the, to the outcome. W and one of them is free stream turbulence or other forms of incoming disturbances. If you're looking at a laminar separation bubble transition on dynamic stores. So how do you isolate those effects? They, th then we need a great deal of information about the environment in the wind tunnel. And it could be that we cannot do a simulation that has the span long enough. I'm talking about L LES that has the, we don't have the computer to do at a high Reynolds number the span that is necessary. So we don't know whether that's the right answer once you get a dynamic stall vortex that is large scale. By the same token, if the aspect ratio in the experiment is only four, I wonder what is the answer associated with a vortex on top of a wind tunnel, in a wind tunnel that is above a wing that is pitching and it has some span-wise instabilities or the like. And then that's where it becomes a little bit obscure and you have to be working closely with the experimentalists to say, well, this is good for comparison, this perhaps is not. And it has to be an honest conversation, which sometimes it doesn't happen a posteriori. And, and, and another thing is that it is in the past, in many cases, at least from the CFD point of view, many people do the same experimental case. But not every time we see a series of good experiments on exactly the same case using multiple facilities or aspect ratios and so on, which also would increase confidence. Uh, but I know this is expensive. Doing two experiments is going to be twice the cost. So with very few exceptions like NASA, FOSR workshops or some RTO activities, we very rarely see that kind of, and 
that kind of collaboration where you're doing work specifically for for increasing the degree of comfort or confidence. So. And that would be needed. But that, that would be something to concur with that. To concur with that. So we have a question from the audience that states, PIV is mature in canonical flows, but what challenges exist for more complicated applications such as turbo machinery? So let, me, let me pick on the first part of that first. Ron, would you say PIV is sufficiently mature for use in canonical flows? Um, well, the good thing about canonical flows is we already know a lot about them. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so we can, um, you know, uh, design the PIV experiment to, to optimize the PIV measurements. Um, when you go into an unknown flow, uh, you, you don't really know what the variation of velocity uh, and what the variation of scales will be. And so you're going to have to iterate. Uh, um, it, that iteration would be much simpler if instead of having a two-digit voltmeter, we had a three-digit voltmeter. And, you know, coming back to the question about, or uh, the observation about uh, the skill level of the operator determines much of the quality of the measurements. Again, if we had a three-digit voltmeter, you wouldn't have to be so careful about your measurements. You're still gonna, they're going to still fall in the right range uh, so that they're valid. So I think in that sense, um, I, I wouldn't, Call PIV developed until we really get to the point where we we have 0.1 percent accuracy, or something approaching, that. and, and um, then you could go into relatively unknown situations. And, and it, yeah, I, I, maybe a, an analogy would be helpful. Think of photography. When photography was new, and you had to illuminate your your scene with an explosion of <laughs> Some, some powder uh, held in a tray <laughs> and so on and and if you didn't really you didn't really have much range you could operate in and still get adequate information and so on so there were there were scenes you just couldn't photograph uh, and um, and I, th I think that the, the more capability we have I mean, you look at our cameras now and our in our smartphones um, they're the, you, we don't have to adjust anything, and, and they can adjust themselves to give you a nice photograph. So we're a long ways from that. Susan and Fulvio, you, you've both done work in, in flows that are definitely not canonical. Have you experienced some challenges there that suggest PIV still needs to improve its, its maturity before it's answering those problems? I, I, I think definitely yes. I mean, we are working towards, towards the, um, I guess, the r routine use of PIV. Uh, again, looking at when you have a, a, a toolbox, what's the best tool, right? I mean, if you only have one tool, you always use that tool. But, but we have to have a range of tools. Uh, so we still look at pressure measurements. We're developing pressure-sensitive paint. We're Looking, we still use LV in certain uh, areas where it's, say, really difficult to get a light sheet in or something that, that might be uh, where we need to use that technique. So you want to have the tools in your toolbox, then how do you use them? And certainly uh, rotor wake and rotor flow, and s uh, a lot of times if you look at the fuselage shape of a rotor craft, it's got a bluff back end, uh, especially on some of like the emergency medical they have a clamshell. It's a bluff body. There's a lot of bluff body separation in those areas. And when you're trying to look at flows uh, in that area, you know, it's difficult to get seating in there. Uh, there's difficult in large scale facilities where you're blocked by perhaps the fuselage you're trying to make measurements. And so you've got a lot of, a lot of implementation pieces as well as the difficulty in looking at the resolution in the large, the large field of view and then the, the processing afterwards. So, I, I don't think we're there yet as, um, as a, re, you know, push button technology, but that's where we'd like to go. We'd like to say that you, know, you go into one of our NASA wind tunnels that we put this technology in and you say, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm doing this test and I'd like to get, you know, force data, this data, and, and you could check off, you know, PIV data as well and you have confidence that that data 
will be uh, the accuracy that you require uh, when you come out. So that, that's our goal. I, I would add also, I see, <clears throat> I will touch two very extreme cases. One is, uh, say, low-speed aerodynamics. Uh, that could also be the case for the, for the rotorcrafts. And uh, yesterday we saw the, the presentation of Marcus. Uh, he was presenting this, uh, uh, um, say, disc of the, of the rotor. And I don't know how many dozens of planes were measured there with PIV. This really means that it's an unfair battle. That you have a plane and this thing is uh, helical and it's fully three-dimensional and is also very inhomogeneous. Somewhere you need a high resolution, somewhere you don't care at all what is happening. It mm -hmm. would be enough just one a single point. Yeah, so there, I, I think, where, uh, where I see PIV inadequate is with this complex, large-scale, three-dimensional systems. I would wish that we come to a point where we can tackle the problem in the same dimensions, three-dimensional, also at a scale not uh, uh, of a square foot, but perhaps of a cubic meter. It would help in incredibly, because then you, you can really tackle uh, the, the also having more cameras placed all around so that you, you haven't got the problem. Say if one camera has the, the fuselage that is obstructing, the other camera will not have it. Different directions for illumination. This would make uh, life probably much easier. Uh, the, the other extreme is um, uh, uh, very high speed aerodynamics. It's now proven that PIV can tackle flows in supersonic conditions up to Mach 2, Mach 3 with a fairly good uh, accuracy, certainly in uh, laboratory wind tunnels. But then uh, as soon as you go to higher regimes, hypersonic regime, one of the, the problem that is still there, the, the stumbling block, and you know it because you work in that area, Steve, and uh, is, uh, is uh, how do we make the tracers such that they can really follow this uh, uh, shock waves, this strong acceleration in the, in the hypersonic regime that's also characterized by very low densities. When, when we are speaking about, uh, for instance, uh, expansion uh, wind tunnels as we have in Delft. So there I see PIV inadequate in the sense that we haven't solved yet uh, the, the problem of uh, one of the fundamental problems that Ron was explaining today, really the fidelity of the particle tracers. Well, I, I have an affinity for potentially controversial questions, so I'm all over this one. <laughs> How has the ease of use of commercial PIV systems made it too easy for less knowledgeable users to collect bad data. Now, I, I want to be careful here. We don't want to bash the vendors because they've been very important to our community in giving us uh, great new technologies at affordable prices. But I can look out amongst the community and see some data sets out there that I wish had probably stayed undercover. Do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, well, I'll, I'll say that uh, about Ten years ago, I guess, um, Dr. Gao had the un misfortune to try to teach me how to use PIV systems. <laughs> so, all right, as a very inexperienced user, uh, I could certainly get bad data easily, many times. So, but with someone who had experience, right, uh, uh, helping me along to, to then understand what I was doing incorrectly, right, then we were able to get good data in, in that situation. So I know that the, having the push button is very, uh, very convenient, but I, I think it is like, you know, turning a, something into your calculator or your computer if you don't look at your output and you don't have an understanding of what the output should be, then it's very easy to get bad calculation. Um, my, my first boss, uh, you know, he said, hey, everything was on a slide rule, right? He never dropped a digit. He always knew his decimal digits because they had to know that in order to, to make that work on a slide rule. You know, I punch it in my calculator, and if it comes off an order of magnitude off, huh, what you know, if you don't really think about that and you don't understand it, you're likely to make those kind of mistakes. So I, I think the, the ease of the system is good, but um, I think there's not necessarily the documentation of what's happening in the black box so that even an experienced user has to really work at finding out what's going on inside the box. And, and you'll be fine if you want to use that for exactly what it was designed for, but if you want to take it non-conventional or something really different, then per, you, know, you need a better understanding of what's inside the box. I, I, I have a, a, an add, an add a comment there. I think the, the, the problem is the, actually the fact that the computers have an, a hard drive. 
if the computers would have no hard drive, then we would have no problem of this type because then somebody in the, in the laboratory would do the experiment. Experiment means having the laser flashing and a camera acquiring it. You would see things on the screen. You would see the, the, the particle images. Then you would see the vectors. And then you would ask yourself, is this good or not? And then you ask this question yourself a few times. Uh, first, you realize that the cameras are not maybe perfectly focused. The second, you realize that the laser is not exactly there where you wanted it. And the third, you realize that the seeding in, uh, concentration could have been optimized. And four, you realize at the end if the phenomenon that you expect occurring is, is there or not. Maybe you forgot to, to open the wind tunnel. <laughs> and, yeah, exactly. and then, after, only after that, I would say the supervisor, the manager, or the professor comes and give you a hard drive. You say, okay, now you can store the data. <laughs> so the problem, the problem is to, to, to keep people uh, from recording the data for a little longer. Be <laughs> Otherwise, you always have the problem that, that you, you rush and you feel satisfied at the end of the day only if the, the, your TB, terabyte indicator, has, <laughs> has increased. So the, the idea is to, to bring back the experiment at the level of an experience and not just acquiring, acquiring, acquiring data. So and I don't know how it is with the, of course, for PIV, it, the idea would be to have a system that is kind of real time or online, gives you a feedback which is a luxury, I'm afraid that uh, for CFD, having a, a, a real-time simulation that gives you the, 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 the flow field must be quite challenging. Yeah, well, if it's small enough, I guess, but not practical <laughs> simulations. No, not, not for practical yeah. possibilities. But no. going back to the idea of, of, of packages and so on, the same issue occurs in CFD. Yeah. I mean, you're giving a package, to, you give it to multiple users, the user skill and the care in executing the CFD is going to be critical to the outcome. It's, it's a generic. So how problem. do you sift, whether it's CFD <laughs> or PIV, how do you sift the data that you trust from the data you don't trust? Is it just based on the reputation of the user? Is it based on consistency of similar experiments and computations? Um, if we see disagreements between different data sets or disagreements between PIV and CFD, which do we choose to believe? Well, there, at least in CFD, there are many steps you take and you do that to the extent possible in posing the problem correctly, boundary conditions and so on. You have to go through systematic grid re resolution studies, and you have to be aware, depending upon Reynolds number, Mach numbers, and so on, what are the limitations of the simulation tool you're using, whether it's LES or RAMs or hybrid RAMs and so on. So, so, so you have to be very systematic in doing the problem to reduce the uncertainties. At the end, there'll be a bunch of uncertainties left, and that's what we then we look to experiments for the answer. But, but essentially it has to do in the execution of the problem. Unfortunately, we don't have a tool that you say just turn it on, uh, although that would be an objective to have a very high order methodology, self-adaptive in space and time that by itself will look at the flow and track everything and you do nothing essentially, except look at the results at the end. So that, does, that doesn't exist. So you, along the way, like you're saying, you have to keep looking at it when you use, do the first simulation and see if something looks correct or not. You have to refine here, you have to refine there, and you have to reduce the time step if you find that the scale of some phenomena is very high frequency. So it, it's not a simple process. It, so I don't, I don't think there is an easy answer. That's a, what I'm trying to convey. And it takes experience, uh, and it takes the desire to do a well-executed uh, uh, computation and it takes the resources to be able to to look through multiple measures and so on. But I, I would also add your your question was you know which one do you believe, and I would say well you don't believe either one. Yeah. That's right. You, you take them both in their context of where their strengths are, right? Where their known weaknesses are, where their you know what area you're comparing them, where do they agree, where they disagree, and what you have to look at is what is it telling you. You don't necessarily have, it's not necessarily one or the other, and I, I think it definitely depends on the flow that you're looking at and your experience level with that. Yeah, but, but, but there are some uh, concrete elements that you can base, uh, that you can take into account. Yeah. If, uh, if we speak about the experiment, if the experiment has been properly documented, if in the experiment, for instance, there is a, a, a systematic uh, uncertainty analysis, if the properties of the experiments are documented in terms of uh, 
uh, not only of the uh, hardware, uh, but also of the, the, the properties of the measurement, like dynamic range and uh, the, the, the thickness of the laser, the density of the particle, so that you can really see that the figures given for spatial resolution, the figures given for the accuracy of the velocity, the figures given for the uh, position of the field of, of the measurement, <laughs> Sometimes the first uncertainties are just in, in, the, in space, you said, you know, where, where is it? Is it a, a bit above, a bit below? So these type of figures, when, when there is a good documentation, then certainly this is a good, uh, in fact, a necessary condition, I think, for, for, for trustworthiness. And then about the repeatability, you have to repeat the experiment. <laughs> so if, you, if the experiment would be repeated a few times, I think you were also advocating it, eh, Miguel? Like saying, well, if, no, if but, some type but, of problems but would be repeated. But not necessarily by the same person no, in no, the same indeed, facility. Indeed, <laughs> indeed. Changing, changing, changing the players in the Yeah, in changing the, the player, changing maybe the chord of a wing, the model size relative to wing or size. Or just changing laboratory. Or, and changing laboratory. Yeah, yeah. and then you well. would say, okay, this is absolutely Definitely, an experiment yeah. that, that is trustworthy and can be taken yeah, as right. a benchmark for uh, CFD validation in this case. Well, it would be nice to have Ron's PIV equivalent of a cell phone camera. I think about all the different ways you can get a simple pitot probe measurement wrong. Uh, so, so perhaps it's just a, as well that we, um, we are cognizant of having to rely on the skill and experience of the user, even when it's just a pitot probe. Well, I have to say, even with a modern camera, I still photograph my thumb quite often. <laughs> <laughs> but with terabytes of memory, you can throw that one out. Yeah. Uh, another question we have, so what Excuse is holding... Excuse me, Steve, if I interrupt. Sure. Is it possible that we ask also the audience if they have questions that they would like to put from the audience? Or is um, this not allowed by the That's form. where these are coming is from. There? But uh, if there's Ooh, anybody who the has a question that they haven't uh, submitted online and wishes to step to the microphone, certainly they can do so. Uh, but one of those audience questions, uh, what is holding PIV back from more widespread deployment in wind tunnels or other testing facilities? Uh, well, I, I do think that there's, you know, we've just been talking about how important it is to have uh, the experience base of the op operators and the and so you, you have, I think, a lot more wind tunnels than you have experienced operators and even systems. Um, we tend to uh, invest in systems that are somewhat portable uh, in that if they're needed in one facility, we, we take them to that facility. If they're needed in another, we take them to that facility. So having a, a, a dedicated system at facilities so you invest in a system that stays at that facility, but at that point you have to invest in, in, in operators and users at the facility, right? Not our outside group of experts that come in and run the system for that test, but actually having the, the people at the facility, just like they've learned to set up, as we talked about force balances or ESP pressure systems, you know, we have to have that investment in the experience level that sets up and acquires PIV. I think that's a real barrier because I, I think there's a limited, um, you know, limited expertise, a lot of training, and then you have to use it, right? You got to practice, and and that's sometimes hard to do. I concur with that. I think uh, at the moment, if we if we want a good expert for a wind tunnel operation, uh, a master degree is a very 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 minimum requirement. Very often they are doctors. Who, that, that operate uh, the, the PIV systems, or an engineer with a, with a 10 years plus experience in uh, in PIV systems. So I think one the, one of the largest investment is in uh, forming these people in order to have them in the in the facilities, and that has a cost. So this is probably one of the limiting factor. And then the second part is uh, uh, is the two faces of the medal. A PIV is very appealing uh, at at several lab scale because it's very versatile. You buy a system, you can do many things. You can do uh, the micro channel, you can do the, the small wind tunnel, you can also attempt to doing something at a large scale. But the versatility co also comes as a weakness. Because it's versatile, it's never crystallized into a very rugged, robust system that you bring there like a, like a robot and, 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 and makes the measurement. It's not like the, the LDA system, I'm not an expert there, but the LDA system at the some moment was configured with everything in one head. So you have the two beams going and then also the, the, the receiver coming there. In PIV, you have the laser somewhere and the cameras somewhere else and everything has to be uh, coordinated. So this costs time 
and always uh, uh, add uh, some uncertainties. And the, the, maybe the third point, I, I still push on that side, I have seen uh, far too many, uh, even in our uh, university where we don't have a very large wind tunnels, I've seen far too many of patchworks. This really means that we are kind of at, at the limit with the capabilities of the, of the scaling of the system. So we are still with a half a meter, half a meter or a square foot at a time and then scanning. This is becoming almost, the larger gets the wind tunnel, the more PIV becomes like a point-wise measurement. So th this, this uh, could possibly be evolve uh, in, the, in the future for a more massive deployment. More large format technique. More large That's format cool. will help and, uh, and at some moment uh, the tracers. For illumination, I don't see the way how we can have even uh, more density of the energy from the, from the lasers, but probably the LEDs could, uh, could change a bit uh, the, the scenario. Perhaps advancing our voltmeter from two digits to three. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I, I'd like to add that you mentioned the particles, fulvio, fulvio and, and uh, they are so important. They're the source of the signal, and they're so neglected. <laughs> uh, we really need some chemists and chemical engineers working on producing particles that would be tailored for PIV, both in liquid flows and and, and gas flows. And uh, you know, you look at. Um, what are you going to do if you don't have enough um, laser energy to, um, to uh, get good PIV images? Well, you go out and buy a laser that's, what, maybe twice as big, and it'll cost you several hundred thousand dollars uh, when you start getting up into the really powerful ones. And, um, but you don't have much up beyond that. You can't go out and buy one that's ten times as big or a hundred times as big. But with particles, you could change the scattered light intensity by those factors. Um, and, and so we need to engineer, uh, to me, that's the sweet spot for a lot of these large-scale facilities is to engineer the particles um, that will scatter a lot of light at the angles that we want. And, and uh, incidentally, one thing you can certainly do is not use 90-degree light scattering. You, uh, you know, there are other there are other angles that are uh, much stronger, and and um, and so on. So, um, you know, I I'd rather if I if I were trying to improve PIV and I had a certain amount of money to give a researcher, I'd much rather give it to a researcher who'd make better particles than to uh, someone who's who's uh, making a more powerful laser or or improving software. I think that. Really, there's a lot to be had there. Let's hope that there is room for two grants. <laughs> <laughs> Laser and particles. Well, and I'd also say, too, that I think that the particles, uh, you have to also look at the facilities that those particles are going to be used in. And I'll just give a, a recent example. Uh, we had a, a test program that was going to go into the icing research tunnel in Essa Glen. It was not an icing test, but the tunnel had the right speed range, the model fit in there, and we wanted to, to do that, that work in that facility. And so uh, the, the folks that were doing that were coming from a university and, and thought that uh, they had uh, everything arranged well to do PIV in that facility. Got all the safety things taken, uh, taken care of. And then what happened is that because it's an icing facility, it has a different uh, chillers and mechanisms in order to create the ice. And it turns out that the particles that they were looking at using, which would be perfectly reasonable for you know, other air tunnels, uh, would collect on, on this uh, structure in the tunnel, and the facility would not allow those particles to be used in that facility. So you know, that was kind of a, oh, 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 a, a stopping point for us. So, you know, and, and they ended up looking at varying the, the density in that tunnel, which can be done, and trying to use uh, water particles, which they had. For, uh, and, and so we were able to successfully complete the test, but you know, up until that point, we really hadn't thought about the seating. So your point's well taken that that's certainly an area that needs to be addressed. But I think it might also, one size might not fit all in terms yeah. of, oh, of what you're gonna use yeah. for the seating. I know in, in 14 by 22, after we do a significant amount of PIV, then we have to pay to clean the anti-turbulence screens, right? And so we, we 
that's a cost to doing the test. So we, you know, we factor that in, but that, that has to be done after you've done that kind of work. And there's the expense of the particles. If you're in a very large facility, a very expensive particle will be one of your Right. Do you use oil-based or uh, a water-based uh, type of uh, uh, PSL, droplets? right? Is it PSL? It's oil-based. Those are water-based. Oh, solid. Solid. Okay. We have another question here that I find intriguing. Uh, Ron, you had mentioned that PIV led to the discovery of hairpin vortices. We have other examples of fluid phenomena that have been discovered by PIV. And not necessarily well, for Ron. Um, yeah, I can, uh, I'm thinking, for example, of, of um, some work by Charles Williamson at, at Cornell where um, he, he's interested in, in uh, vortices and, and uh, flow structure interactions and I remember seeing a seminar where um, he, he was actually able to, to see that one vortex was actually made up of four individual vortices and, and if you averaged over it of course you'd never see them but uh, um, and, um, and, and you also had to be in the right frame in order to see them if you uh, if you took a lab frame, you wouldn't see them either, but, but if you took a frame rotating with the overall vortex, you, you could see them. So um, I thought that was, I, I don't know how important that's been, but I, I thought that was, uh, you know, the sort of discovery you wouldn't, you wouldn't make with a point-wise measurement. Yeah. I have also now comes to my mind, uh, some of my colleagues are working on, uh, on um, uh, swept wings and the phenomenon of uh, boundary layer transition how to how to manipulate possibly the route to uh, to the to turbulence from the laminar boundary layer passing through in the swept wing passing through the uh, so-called uh, cross flow instability and um, they started with uh, some hot wire survey of this as uh, also done by of course by professor Saric uh, extensively and then they started to look at it with hot wire, with the oil flow visualization, and now they start coming with a, a tomographic PIV. They seem to see for the first time the secondary instability mechanism that is incepted on top of the primary, say, lines, that is the, 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 the cross flow instability, which uh, I think if, if they can prove that that is uh, the, uh, the, the final step before transition, I might say that is uh, something that uh, was not uh, measured by other uh, experimental methods. And I suppose that, well, maybe, I don't know if this, this, is, uh, this is dealt with in uh, simulation, this uh, cross-flow. Yeah, it has been. Yeah? The, the several yeah, bifur bifurcations. Yeah. Uh, yes, that's also. Yeah, I think that there are many examples of vortex flows and, uh, and vortical structures that have been identified by PIV. That we, I mean, vortex breakdown is an example where flow visualization really couldn't provide, although there are very good flow visualizations, some people are artists at doing that, mm -hmm. but, but, but PIV added a considerably much more systematic understanding of the flow structure, even if, you, even if in a 2D plane from which you could correlate CFD to develop a 3D model, for example and many wake vortex flows. So it has been keen understanding many vortical structures which are, of course, uh, important for unsteady loading. But perhaps nothing as prominent as hairpin vortices. But not, yeah, that's right. <laughs> I have to make one correction. I, 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 we didn't discover hairpins. What we <laughs> discovered is packets of hairpins, <laughs> uh, which uh, I think hairpins actually goes back to a man named Thea Dorson who worked for NACA, N-A-C-A, and, and published some papers in the early 50s, uh, uh, which went largely neglected for 25, 30 years. Yeah. Every discovery is built on a previous yeah. discovery. Yeah. Yeah. So as we uh, move towards winding this conversation down, um, to a layperson, how would you describe the practical applications of PIV or its everyday uses or the, um, the influences it has had on flight vehicles? So we're talking, you know, to, to somebody when we try to explain what exactly we're trying to do, we said, we want to fix the flow. So we want to make helicopters quieter, faster, and safer. 
right? If I want to, and I want to fix the flow, and I can't see it, so I don't know how to fix it. And that's how we explain what does PIV bring to it. It lets me see the flow. Once I can see it, I can start to fix it. And, and that you know, goes back into the, the wake, the performance, the vibration, and, and in fact, how the wake intersects the blades, it makes that really annoying sound. And so that's, it's part of our large effort in order to, to, to fold up into the entire vehicle system and make things better for the, the vehicle and the flying public. That's kind of our... Make visible the invisible. Yeah, go. I'll, I'll take the liberty of, of answering the question too. I often describe it as we can build a wind tunnel model and put it on a balance and measure the lift and the drag. But if we want to know why it has the lift it has, why it has the drag it has, we need a technique like PIV that can reveal the flow over that body and allow us to, to correlate that to the aerodynamic response. And then, then the answer will be, once you do the experiment, you, you will not know why that lift and that drag is there, but you certainly know why you see reflections when the laser is shining <laughs> over the bottom. <laughs> well, I, I often just say that uh, PIV is to a fluid dynamicist like an MRI is to a doctor. Um, and, and um, I mean, it, again, it goes back to seeing mm -hmm. what's going on. And, and so it's, it's, a, it's an improved form of, qu of flow visualization because it allows you to actually see inside rather than just looking at the interface between a marker and a clean fluid like smoke air. Um, but then also we're using it very quantitatively now. Uh, so it has those two aspects. So why don't we close with uh, with this final question? Where do you think where do you think PIV will be ten years from now? Or from a different perspective, where does wind tunnel testing or CFD need PIV to be ten years? From now? So so I would look at ten years as almost a stepping stone. I think it's going to take us a little bit longer get to where I'd really like to see it, which is the full volume 3D uh, systems that are turnkey. Right? Might as well wish for the whole thing if you're going to be wishing. Uh, so in the 10 year time frame, I think we are at least within our, our project going to ex expand the, the field of view, the efficiency, and, and particularly the multiple measurements at one time so that we're not only generating the information about the flow field, but about the system that generated the flow field. So I need to have the simultaneous measurements of the flow field, of the loads, of the pressures, the forces, all that at one, at one time. So that's where we're pushing to go. I think that we'll see the improvements in the, uh, in the scalability and then in hopefully in the accuracy and, um, and in the analysis so that we can get faster at turning that around too. I, do, I, don't know, I don't know where it will be in 10 years from now, uh, but I say have a wish that apart from adding to the wish, of course, the one that what, uh, what Susan has mentioned, the having more capabilities, but have a wish that uh, perhaps in 10 years from now, we will see uh, the, the PIV experiment being uh, augmented with uh, uh, the inclusion, with the, the, the concurrence of the CFD capabilities. Of course, this, is, this, is, this can only happen on the basis of mutual trust. This means <laughs> that the experimentalist must have some trust that injecting the, a numerical uh, framework that uh, will complement this data will not uh, uh, reduce the value, but will add value. So there's mutual trust. And also there should be some trust from the numerical community that uh, the, uh, the way how the solutions march at the moment can be conditioned by experiments uh, with no detriment to the, to the advancement of the numerical solution. I, I would see this more really as a, as a, as a step forward. And uh, you, were, um, you were mentioning before, for instance, that, that the people in your team would first make some simulations to see what are the interesting regions and then do the PIV and then, of course, compare. So I would see these two steps possibly joining together with uh, the simulation and the experiment that would become, in fact, would deliver one data set that is a mix of everything. It will be rather complex, of course, to uh, uh, evaluate their uncertainties because then, uh, then uh, you don't know who should be to blame. But this is, uh, this is uh, an additional direction I would like to see 
uh, taking place in the coming 10 years. Miguel, where does CFD well, need us to be in 10 years? Well, I certainly look forward to 3D and steady data where we could really compare one-to-one -one the, the, what we're trying to do now in sections. So w w uh, on our point of view, we're keep increasing our, our computational power and algorithm accuracy and so on. But all this PAV will shed true light on the flow physics, uh, literally, and like uh, uh, unlike the numeric. So, but, but I think that that once we get to the point that these 3D techniques are are able to render a 3D and steady flow field, then we are on par to be able to uh, to examine the data from from both sides. And I think that one of the issues is going to be, I think this was mentioned earlier, how to digest or extract information from massive data sets. And I think in that regard, we should be working together because the techniques are gonna be the same. So whether you go from POD to dynamic mode decomposition to feature extraction, all of those are common areas of interest yeah. that there is room for improvement. John, any predictions? Um, well, a friend of mine asked me what the stock market was going to do. I said, oh, it's going to go up and it's going to go down. You should buy the ones that go up. <laughs> but um, uh, I, I, I see the cameras as a bottleneck. Um, and I can't predict how fast the number of pixels will improve. Um, but but the, um, it, that all depends on the demand of people who put satellites up and so on and and, and uh, but I do know that I bought a a one megapixel camera the first one that came out from Kodak and I think it was 1992 or 93 so we're 20 years later and they're up to 29 megapixels not that great and so if you want all this volumetric information you want it with good resolution you're going to have to have significantly better cameras and, and um, so um, I, I don't think we can count on Moore's law for PIV. <laughs> not with the same constant. Yeah, not with the same constant, yeah. Do any of our panelists have any uh, other closing comments? I, I think this is a great topic. It's uh, refreshing to get, I think, uh, group of CFD, PIV all together and thinking about how we work together. So I'm encouraged to see that. That's certainly something we're uh, demanding of our research staff. Well, I'd like to thank Steve because he did yeah. a lot of work in organizing the panel and, and keeping the logistics going. So thank That's you right. for putting this together. Indeed, I concur. Maybe if there is any question that could not pass through, because I still don't trust that you have not manipulated, <laughs> that, that you have not manipulated the, the discussion. Unless you have some questions oh, seated I, in oh, the audience. Oh, JT audience. does have. Oh, I see. Does your phone not work, JT? Oh, I didn't okay. get that. Okay. Oh, okay. I just asked you see there is a case. Uh, now, I hope it's unfiltered. for you. I hope it's yours. Um, <laughs> recently, uh, we worked with our CFD group at NASA Ames. Uh, come up with a tool uh, that would allow for the CFD solution to produce uh, PIV type particle images. Uh, and we did a lot to try to do a simple experiment, a, a flow over cylinder. Uh, they uh, performed a, uh, I believe is DES calculation. We did several cycles. Um, we had a, a grad student write the tool. And so the, the idea that I had was to take the uh, simulated PIV image out of the specific solution that was done on the fly and process it the same way that I processed my PIV data, experimental data. Um, and we came up with a pretty darn accurate comparison. It was pretty remarkable. Uh, we haven't published that one yet, uh, but uh, I, I was wondering if, if that strategy is something that uh, you or see as a, a possible good way to go uh, from here on out, or do you think that there's potentially a dead end on, on that? I, I'd just like to see if, it, if, if you think that you could concur with that idea. Um, I, 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 I comment on that. I, I think that um, this is 
one of the big differences between CFD and and um, uh, PIV is that in CFD the boundary conditions are perfect and the inflow conditions are perfect. In 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 the laboratory, they're certainly not. This has been mentioned earlier, and. Uh, um, People are often wondering what should I use for a realistic inflow condition? What sort of disturbances are causing my transition and, and so on? And I, I would think that actually uh, using PIV to find those inflow conditions and not just in terms of turbulence intensity, but in terms of their uh, geometric form and, 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 and um, their, their size scales and time scales. Uh, would be uh, very helpful to a, a, a CFD uh, computation as, as an input. Uh, and of course, you can always try the other strategy of uh, say, say you aren't computing right from the inlet, but you're starting down, downstream and recycling or something like that. You can take experimental data as an input and, and, and uh, uh, as long as it's um, it's a um, uh, boundary layer type code. You can just have data upstream and 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 uh, and go ahead and, and um, you don't have to have the whole volume. Is what I'm saying. So. I I I, th I have the feeling that uh, you are trying to propose a, a more efficient way for NASA to work. So let me see if I understand. Uh, you produce a numerical simulation. Uh, then, out of this numerical simulation, you put particles in, and then you make a, a sort of PIV experiment, and the result, you can label it as an experiment. So, no. Uh, no. But close. <laughs> sure. Sure, it was ironical, of course. So, so I will comment, though, JT, what, what you described, where you compared exactly the, with the re same resolution, the numerical experiment and the physical experiment. And you came out with a better uh, correlation. Uh, I'll, there's there's been other ways that we've also done that. You know, when we use unsteady pressure data, and and we look at the comparison of, you know, the discrete pressure locations, and then if you take only the CFD calculations at I, those discrete I, uh, locations, you see you match much better. So and so, what, to me, what that says is that in the experiment there is a discretization yeah. error, that the CFD doesn't have because it has such greater resolution. And so from that standpoint, you have to be very careful that you don't take experiment as gospel, right? Experiment is not always ground truth because it has measurement errors, it has these discretization errors. So when you have a CFD solution that matches perfectly to the data when only those comparisons are used, then you say to yourself, okay, if I then up the resolution, what else is the CFD telling me? And now can I believe it? And I think that's a very powerful use of it. And so what you're describing is a very similar effect to what we've already seen in terms of using unsteady pressure data and how we compare those to, to, to CFD. And, and I think that's a very valuable thing to what you're saying. What's more accurate? Well, it's are you looking at the same things and are you inducing the same amount of discretization error? All right, so I think we'll, uh, we'll let that be the final comment for the panel. Uh, before I give up this microphone, however, there are a few people I want to thank for making this event happen. Sivaram Goganini in particular, but also from our committee, uh, Paul Danahy, Brian Thoreau, and Todd Lowe, and from the AIAA conference organizer side, uh, Rob Gregg, Rick Walls, and Pam Bertelson. So thanks to all of you for making this happen. This was fun. We should do it again at SciTech. <laughs> <laughs>